All right. So, uh, hi, everybody. This is uh, Yussel Missile Productions. My name is Stephen Yussel, and uh, today I'm joined here with Tom Althaus. He's the author of the script, The Immortals. And I'll let Tom get into detail about uh, what exactly that is and how it's had an effect on our culture over the past three decades. So um, it's great to have you here, Tom. Um, thanks for joining me and uh, having this conversation. Um, I guess my first question for you would be, um, how did you come about starting uh, putting the script together for the Immortals and uh, what were your influences and uh, people uh, that were surrounded by you at the time? And um, yeah, just how, how that all came together. Love the question. Uh, basically, the Immortals actually is comes about as a need-based project. A lot of times now they say that um, the Matrix is a documentary style. Well, they don't explain that. Uh, yeah, I was I was doing something where I needed to. It was like life and death. Get a, something out to the public where they may be warned of what's going on in our world. It actually had a deep purpose behind it. It also was intended by this author to reunite his family. My family was taken from me. And uh, <clears throat> my kids meant a lot to me. That's why there's a little girl at the end in Matrix Point of the Sun. She's reunited with her daddy in the actual original, not the Oracle. And so what you have is this deeply um, purposeful project, which is just flowing through. And the characters around me at the time, I'm at Pat Robertson's um, uh, university, grad school, believe it or not. And I realized this is a horror show. Everything's taken from me my jobs, my education, um, and people mocking, I find out this is just, it's a horror show. And so the man has plans for a one world society, the future, he's got a sex ring. I'm just like, what is going on? So I lose everything under, when, they, when you find out about this stuff or brought into that kind of situation, everything's taken. They, they don't take a chance with victims, they destroy them. So I was exposed to everything in one big dose after being an A student, um, future, all kinds of connections, making it in a place that had a 50% attrition rate. Network uh, position being offered where I'd be the face of the Christian coalition, a brand new thing when he's running for president in 1988, Pat Robertson. So wow. what do you do with that when everything's gone, your life's being threatened, you know? Well, you can whisper through art. You can, I, my idea, uh, Steve, was to put something forward that maybe future generations would benefit from. I didn't think I was gonna make it. And so I thought, well, I'll just, whisper through art and this thing in the piece in the future will mean something to people. It'll explain this time to people and maybe other families won't go through it and children will be helped too. So that was the purpose. Never thought that it would take off. Who's the players around me? Pat Robertson, his um, cronies, um, that whole uh, religious right grouping where I found out there is no loyalty. People will just stomp on you for reward. They wanna get ahead. It's like ants climbing on top of each other to get top of the hill no insult to ants. So the thing is that that's what was going on. And suddenly I'm contacted by different elements, uh, Hollywood elements directly because Pat Robertson had a, um, a couple named Judy and Ned Nankovich. Ned was an adjunct professor at his university called CBN University at the time, which changed to region ruling in place of God, gives you an idea of their mentality. So Ned contacts me and says that Judy, his wife, who's a model, very beautiful woman, model and model agent, who has me work for her a little bit. Uh, just got top positions, not as a model, but as a story develop, uh, development uh, uh, employee at Disney and Universal Studios. So right away, Robertson shows his connection with Disney, more so by saying his people are now connected to um, Disney and Universal directly to coveted positions, East Coast to West Coast. Wow. And they want my work. So that's happening too, while a, another student of Pat Robertson, um, Nadia Santino, is approaching me. Beautiful woman, they use the beautiful woman, approaching me. I want to work with you, want to work with you, just like Judy said. And give me your script, because my dad is Lenny Coco, or father-in-law is Lenny Coco, Lenny Coco and the Chimes, still one of the top 100 billboard hits of all time for um, ballads from the 60s. And he's best friends with Bonaventure of Warner Brothers. 
So here comes Disney, Warner Bros. all at once after the works it, while, while it's being created and when it's done being created. So they're making sure access is going right to them. The players are basically all the main elite. I have FBI involved in me. They give me a card. I did a program called America's Most Wanted season premiere. They gave me a card. Please extend every courtesy to Tom Mulhouse through the Sheriff's Department. I've got Mafia contact me. When I lost everything at Pat Robertson's organization, Mafia stepped in. I am not kidding you. This story is like... So I had a, a man named Jerry Ganazzo come to a woman and I, that a woman that took me in, and boy, does she have a story. Um, it's like this novel. It's, it's crazy. But Hollywood saying your life story is bigger than the matrix. And now Hollywood is interested in life story. Their attorneys are even going, we get goosebumps over the real life story. That's where everybody's gonna be looking because that's where matrix comes from and immortals. So what happens is a woman shows up in my life while I'm going to finish writing the material, right? Whispering through art, what's going on in a setting that's um, fictitious but drawing all the elements of what I know Pat Robertson's planning in our world with elements of Disney and things. So I'm like, all right. So Otika Ball comes along. Who's Otika Ball? A beautiful woman, absolutely stunning, drop dead gorgeous. Former Miss um, America runner up Oklahoma, whose uncle is Senator David Boren, senior Senator, former senior Senator David Boren at the time. So he, she's also related, cousin is Paul Ryan. This family is the Republican Party. And both her mom and dad are doctors, loving to death, just wonderful people. And what happens is she saves my life. I had everything taken away. Robertson doesn't take a chance. When I was part of his sex ring, was drawn into his sex ring with a, a doctor, Sova, who's now at Falwell's, you know, Liberty University. Look at the staff of the communication department. Just, it's a flaming obvious. And that's where Robertson sent him after they got too hot. So he's the one that took me on a trip, Soba, because I was being branded to be the face of Christian coalition, top coveted position, Robertson's organization before I write this material. And he takes me on this trip alone to DC in his motorhome. Don't bring any money. Don't worry about it. It's supposed to be a wonderful time to quote, just have fun in the sex ring. And it's telling me about, you know, Pat Robertson being the head of it and that, you know, it goes all the way to the top. And that's other professor, Dr. Scheel, who's a former Catholic priest, that he thought that I was his boy. And now I'm going to be his boy. I'm like, I don't want to be anybody's boy. I just want to do good work, you know, and get, a, you know, make things happen. And so he's, that whole trip was an absolute nightmare. And I lost everything because of that. That's the backstory. There's where the script is going to come from. What's going on? In fact, the first scene that I write is the interrogation scene. The first wow. scene they film in the Matrix is the interrogation scene. In that first filming, just to jump ahead a second, the first thing they put in the interrogation scene, which is the first thing I was writing, is a graphic. And Lutowski said that anything in for a split second or anything, you know, anything in the film is Andy and his alone, Andy and Larry. There's alone, the ones that claim they wrote it and directed and produced, along with Joel Silver. Susanna Bolgen, the art uh, graphic designer, also said, you know, that anything in for a split seconds for the Wachowski's eyes only to keep the project interesting. They didn't even want to do the work. They needed, as Larry said, a ladder to save their career. They mocked it on set, but they had the script in hand, the script right here in hand, while they uh, had a storyboard lifting all the images they thought were cool, all those tabs there. That's just some of the images they lifted out of the work all those tabs and they wouldn't let anybody around them when uh they had the script in hand correct that's right there's a 20 foot rule very good the 20 foot rules there for a reason why a 20 foot rule on a set yeah that what? was the first and only time i've ever heard of that yeah yeah what they have trouble breathing they're a little claustrophobic. no they they don't want that that script right here being seen they don't want it being seen and for those that uh, I expect everybody to be skeptical at first. Absolutely. Please be. That shows you've got to create a you know, thinking mind. There's the date right there on the bottom. And it is December 1999. This is the, this is the copy. This is the copyrights copy of this one. 1999. Well, uh, not, I'm sorry, 1998. 1998, December, when they shoot in 1999. They couldn't even wait. And it's the copyright director and specialist of the copyright office. 
And what's interesting, Steve, is that they copyright, let me just go on this vein right here. They copyright the title, The Immortals. They don't copyright Matrix. So people should get a clue right there. We should really look at this right here where they don't copyright The Matrix. They copyright Assassins. So you have Assassins copyrighted with Dina Laurentiis who wined and dined the Wachowskis. I'm jumping ahead a second, I'll go back. But so when this thing is taken, you know, written, pitched to Bonaventura, who still claims he discovered and shepherded the Matrix story. Yeah, well, he's the man I pitched to. You know, he would understand it. Now, did they pull the name The Matrix from your script? Is it mentioned that, anywhere in there or no? That is the perfect question right at this time. Because the Wachowskis broke the rules. They have a theft plan. It's the art of war. They always talk about the art of war. And the art of war says what? When your battles before they're fought, right? When you're about, so they had it set up so perfectly to rip this off, how they do it. And the Wachowskis did not follow it because they wanted to get back at them for assassins. In assassins, you have this. This is on the one website. But assassins with the Wachowskis is with also De Laurentiis, Paradise Films. Okay, so Dean Laurentiis, the man that wine and dine him, said they'd be famous in Hollywood. They didn't have anything. They failed at everything they did. They failed at painting, painting business, dropped out of school. Their mom said all they did was play video games and read comic books. So why were they wine and dine by this man, Dean Laurentiis, to be famous in Hollywood? Well, what happens is they are given assassins to do. And the reason assassins, Steve, is because I wrote, when I was at Robertson's organization, a short piece called Assassins. And it was about a, a gentleman who walks into the wrong room. He's going to an AA meeting. He walks into the wrong mood and it's assassins that I've never met going to take one, you know, after this competition where only one will survive. And then he can't leave. He already sees their faces. So he has to bumble through this. And, you know, it's comedy. They turn it into a sexy, you know, they think a sexy beat it up, bang it up thing. And so what happens is there's their name with Dean Laurentiis on the copyright. So there's no excuse that when you have my title, The Immortals, there's Gina Laurentiis on my title, The Immortals. There's his In company. Paradise. Where's Wachowski's? Nowhere. Nowhere. And there's subtitles. Now, why, why would you put 343 subtitles under my title and no body of work, Steve? No body of work. Now you see the art of war at work here. A stupid version of it. Because what they're doing is creating slots at the Copyright Office under my title. Without the Wachowskis, because they haven't been chosen yet to steal the work, they're being tested at this time. And Why do you think they chose that number, 342 titles? That's a good I mean, question. I do not know. I know they're into numerology, these guys. They're into all these. Anything that makes them appear more um, mystique or, or interesting to ladies or other boys. It's like, that's what they do. They want to appear like, <gasps> wow. I think that's why poor children are suffering too, is they, they, they dress up in costumes, they do these things in order to appear more sexy. I don't think it's about really a spiritual belief. I think it's, as they say, it's all about power and anything that makes them look more, you know, wow, I'm cool. That's what it really is. It's, it's a nerd game. And so you've got this immortals, which is the letters immortals. If you take the letters out, you can form, add the X, you get the matrix. They're all into being clever, so they mix around the names, see? And so it's all stupid. When you decipher, it's not cool at all. It's just dumb. Why do you create a slot to the copyright office? Now, see all those, we talked about the subtitles here, right? Yeah. So what the Wachowskis are supposed to do is take one of those subtitles. They're supposed to take one of those subtitles because they created a slot. They took all that effort and, permanently, created slots to the copyright office. The Wachowskis do not. Why? Because the assassins, they brought another writer in. Wachowskis were furious. They're not these fun-loving frat boys as they PR them to be. No, they're angry, bitter little people who are, you know, get furious if anybody, you know, if you watch the interview with Bound uh, on online, on YouTube, they have the Bound. Yeah, yeah I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, you see how they really think and talk, and you also see that arrogance. Like, everybody thinks they can talk to us and tell us what to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's them. That's them. So what happens is they... Uh, are replaced with another writer to finish it because they can't write. In fact, in 1995, after that, they're asked in an article, you know, what are you going to do next? And they say, we're hope we, we're, 
going to do Plastic Man or Carnivore, the only two pieces they actually had coming into this. Plastic Man about a man who defecates radioactive material and uh, Carnivore about somebody who eats rich people. Nobody wanted it. Nobody wants it still. Even after all their success off of my work, they're still peddling those pieces nobody wants. That's unusual. And so that was really, really bad. They said in a 1995 article, you know, what's next? And they said, well, we hope to get Plastic Man and Carnivore done, you know. And then it says, pause in the transcript, and it says, we hope to be given the science project. At the same time, they're saying, we failed as writers in an article. We had to pack our bags and leave Hollywood, quote. Um, we're hoping, the only thing that can help us now is directing a project. So they keep saying this, they failed, right? They can't write. So they think the only thing they can save them is if they direct something. So Joel Silver goes to work for that. He gives them Bound as an audition piece because Wachowskis were not the first choices to fill in those one of those slots off my work, The Immortals. They were not. Bonaventura called it revolutionary. We're making this. And he still claims he discovered and shepherded it, right? And one of the few that understands it, well, that father-in-law of um, Nadia Centino, Robertson's student brought in to lure me in to give my work over. Had my script, father-in-law gave the script to Bonaventura, Lenny Coco gave the script to uh, Bonaventura. He had it, he read it, he knew it, and he had me come up to New York to answer all questions and pitch it. So yes, Bonaventura knew about it, what it was. But his first choice was not the Wachowskis. The first choice was Wendy Wasserstein, the famous Jewish playwright that did the Heidi Chronicles. They wanted a Jewish woman who was successful, not in film writing, but playwriting. And it said in a Warner Brothers entry, one of these copyright entries, it actually said, uh, this isn't it, but going off this kind of format right here at the copyright office, it said, um, Immortals, Army of Darkness, like you see that Army of Darkness on the subtitles on that, the Army yeah. of Darkness is the first one they keep capsulizing. Well, Army of Darkness is what they said on the, in the copyright entry, Wendy Wasserstein, commissioned by Warner Brothers to write the Immortals. You're putting in a copyright on a person saying, that's how you're creating a slot for Wendy Wasserstein. Isn't that incredible? So it's, it, they now say if you're smart enough to write the Matrix story, the Immortals, then you're smart enough to follow the trail. And if people figure it out that you're actually the writer, they come to your aid. And uh, people in the industry have been pointing things out, including people right from the story department itself, contacting and pointing out killer things like this. Let me just put this right up real quick. Um, a second. Okay, like that. In the Animatrix, the Wachowskis can't stop trying to be clever, so they put 7259 on the screen, right filling the screen on a clock, an alarm clock. And that 7259, my birthday is what? July 2nd, 59. The Red wow. Hand 4 past the 4, that Red Hand, Steve? That Red Hand 4 past the 4, well, I was 44 in 2003. That's how they got it on the graphic. So the Red's my age. The Black Hands are exactly my birthday. 7259. You cannot, that's like winning the lottery. I mean, the, the mathematical probabilities of that is impossible. Plus, you're supposed to have copyright on that kind of entry, where the hands in a in a usual entry is 10 after 10, smiling hands in the clock face yeah. in the industry. Right. So mm -hmm. now it's always 7-2. Now the industry is like, well, Tom was just, we all it's common knowledge about Tom's work. We know he wrote it, he has it, it's you know, proven, proceeds. And like you said, 20 foot rule with them. So what do they do? They now put 7-2 on the clocks everywhere. Everything from Walking Dead to anything Netflix does to uh, Man in the High Castle to even cartoons like Ratatouille to Home again. All these have 7-2s on the clock. And if you go to Good Omens, they go farther. 7-2-4-59. Wow. So what you have on a digital, which is supposed to symbolize when the Antichrist is to appear. So I've been tagged by Sophia Stewart and others as the evil one. It's, they're just playing a huge game of, we took the guy's work, and part of that strategy is destroy his life. And Disney is the one that really mastermind this with Mike Lang of Disney, which they don't want him on the air. They keep him quiet, protected by Harvey Weinstein taking the bullets, which is a golden parachute for him. So they were all working inter-studio to accomplish this, to just basically mock you. They said it was worth $800 million at the time. In fact, wow. they called the Disney Library of the hard copies, scripts of the early 90s. This is Vanity Fair quoted. 
with Mike Lang article, article that this hard copies of the early 90s of the script in a New Jersey warehouse in boxes because they had the hard copy given to them. And so what happens is through Robertson's people, they actually said in the Vanity Fair article, that's what's there. And that's why Miramax Films was formed by Disney, putting Mike Lang in place in 1993 when the submission went through in 1993. And what Hossies claim that they, they created the piece fully sometime in 1993. They're not very bright. They actually said that they had notebooks. Fans would really, really remember this, that they said they had handwritten or typewritten notebooks. Typewritten notebooks, good luck with that. But they're just not that smart. And so they have typewritten notebooks. And the only thing they have left, they claimed, was the first page, which is handwritten, with matrix doodled and boxed, where um, Neo's going to a high school. Uh, what, that, what, where, when, where? So they wanted to complete that thread, but that's, that's all they had. They, they claimed it's missing. They also kept changing their creation date, saying that it was sometime before Larry's wedding with Thea Bloom. Smoking Gun did an article on this, where it was like, you know, they had to precede the marriage in order to keep Thea Bloom out of the profits. Well, she's stealing anyway by claiming it because it's my work, they knows it but she wants some of that pie that was stolen. So she's claiming that it was created after their marriage in October, 1993. So I'm perceiving all that. So the Wachowskis claim that people came to the door. Larry claims that all these people from the set came to his door after the fact and said, you didn't create the work sometime in um, 90, late 93, whatever. You created just before your marriage. It's like, oh, right, or something like that, or just, just after the marriage. I'm like, oh, right. So he puts in sworn testimony that that's what it was. Then he changes his testimony, saying that all these people came back to his door again. Can you picture it? In reality, all these people just showing up his doorstep. Larry, whoa, caught me off guard. What's going on? We all just realized simultaneously, all these set and crew people, that you created it uh, just before your marriage. 1993, uh, just 10 days before October 1993, where you were married. It's like, whoa, how'd you come up with that? We don't know. We just saw we're hit with it, came to your door. And are telling you, and hey, that works for you, doesn't it? Because you're in a divorce hearing series where you're trying to prove that you created the work before the marriage. <laughs> Congratulations, we just were sent here. So it's just totally impossible. It's just the mind of infants, infantiles. So what happens is he changes his testimony twice as a short of it. Sworn testimony. And then he says, now change it again. Sworn testimony again changed that it's sometime in 1993 so he can match me. The, the testimony, um, I, I understand there was a court case over this. So when when was that taking place? This court case was a complete sham. And that's the part of the art of war. What they did was they provided their own attorney, their own attorney to throw my case. And watch this. It wasn't even my case. They owned everything from the beginning where uh, this Anthony Rankin went to the same class, classmates, he called himself, of Linda Burrow of Warner Brothers. And what's interesting about Anthony Rankin, how to throw a case, Anthony Rankin, give him a suspended license. Not eligible to practice law. I lost as soon as he took my thing. He approached me. You're not supposed to solicit people, right? But he came to me and solicited me. And he made sure that case was thrown. Not only thrown, Steve. He filed it pro per the day it's supposed to be filed after he ran the clock out on statute of limitations. He took two years to run the clock out, having excuses. We give material, okay, redo this, get this ready, redo this, get this ready, redo this, get this ready. And disappears when it's time to file, statute of limitations. And then appears the day after on an email going, oh, I guess we missed the deadline. I guess that's it. Already case is thrown, right? That's what people have to realize now. They think that it's ends justify the means that people, if they Google, they'll go, lost his case. Really? Seriously? With the evidence we have? If we had a fair venue and a day in court, we would not lose. And they knew that. So the process they use is they provide that ineligible to practice law, suspended license. Yeah, this guy's a clown. And what happens is not only that, he's classmates with Warner Brothers. And what they do is then we think maybe we can still go forward. Maybe it wasn't exactly that time. And then he already knew it was that time it was thrown. They had us in the bag at that point, but running it out. Fraud. And so what happens is they go and he files on what we think may be the only other time we might be able to go for it. It's not. We're already, we lost. Well, I mean, it was taken from us. Other firms wanting to do it, but Rankin kept saying, I'm the one I'm going to put 100000 in on for you. It's con game. 
And so not only that, but they had a woman playing with him, a woman with a criminal record named Becca Northcutt at the time. She had a criminal record, had been incarcerated in jail, multiple warrants on her. And she's the one that comes to me and is mirroring me, Honey Pot Wife, to, wants to marry me. And is talking like, you know, oh my God, I'm, we're so similar. And talking about even things where I would joke around and if someone yawned, it's, it's annoying now, I'd never do it, but I put my finger towards their mouth, into the mouth as a joke. And it, no, it's annoying as hell, but she did that, right? And I'm like, oh my God, Tom, naive at the time. Oh my God, you do the same thing? Oh my God, this, it must be fate. That's kind of how it goes. And so everything is matched, profile, you know, and then suddenly this nun wants to marry you who has a criminal record. And when she leaves, who does she go to, Steve, at the end of the job, throwing the case? When it's done, she throws the case and has access to all materials, right? Right, to whoever runs rank and things tampered. Yeah, she goes right back to Mike Lang. Mike Lang. We have the email to, from Mike Lang to her on my birthday, after the cases are thrown, railroaded, saying, Becca, move in with me for 60 days, question mark, at his mistress pad in Spokane, Washington. Multi-million. Yeah, from Southern California. And that is on my birthday. That's when my son loses his mom, who has nothing to do with him. Said she, I was a job. So it's like total recall. So she doesn't even do anything with Aiden, who's 15 now, brilliant, doesn't have a mom. So the idea is that on that birthday, Mike Lang takes her to Mr. Spad and gave her instant success. That's how it works, right? After Mike Lang left Miramax Films, right when we came forward, Granted, under Rankin. Now, Rankin, suspended license, what are you going to do, Warner Brothers? So he says he's filing and files pro per, right? Well, that's not going to work. That means I'm filing myself. He forged my signature to file myself. He's supposed to be our attorney. He doesn't. So he then sends an email saying, I filed it. It's a go, but I got to talk to you about something. Then he sends another email. I forgot my license was suspended. So you're filed on your own here, but I'll be signing on. He doesn't. The defendants aren't served. He claims he's still working for us. So I say, at the end of the time, we're going to go forward. I need to go uh, talk to the judge. This isn't right. Wait, 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 wait. Right at that point, he has Linda Burrow of Leslie Caldwell and Proctor, Warner Brothers firm, sponsor him or does a, a stipulation to have the defendants served after she sponsors Rankin to have his license reinstated. Why is Warner Brothers attorney reinstating a license of the opposition? Why? And then stipulating that we can serve the defendants because Rankin missed the deadline to serve them. The case is thrown already two, three times. It's thrown, it's lost, You've, but it's fraud, but they don't have something. They don't have the materials yet. They wanna throw the case and have every draft and every script. Why? Because they don't have any. So they want everything I've got. So what they need to do, reinstate Rankin's license. Yes, you lost the time to serve the defendants. It's too late. But we're going to stipulate as Joel Silver's attorney and the Wachowski's attorney and Warner Bros. attorney that you can go ahead and file your case on them. Who would do that in the world as an attorney? Who, what client would say, top high level clients like Joel Silver, who's going to, I mean, he plays in Tropic Thunder. Tom Cruise plays the parody of him in Tropic Thunder, Les Grossman. Do you think that guy who's going like, you know, yeah, this kind of thing, like, you know, screw him, screw him, F him, F him, you know, and I'm going to F you up. That's Joel Silver. Do you think that guy, the most hated man in Hollywood, he calls himself, is going to allow us to file our case after no. it's not going to exist? No, right. But they do. Why? They want the materials. They know it's already thrown. So they stipulate that you can file on the defendants. But they make sure no depositions. No discovery. In fact, Steve, the deposition that's done of me, it's seven and a half hours long, basically. And in it, what's interesting is when we go in, Rankin, Tony Rankin, has a tape recorder. I have a tape recorder. He then tells me, oh, it's illegal to record. Uh, oh, we can't record these sessions. So give me your tape recorder. They match. They're matching. He records everything. And Steve, he gives me the wrong recorder back. He gave me this. Thank you very much. On that is so much fraud you cannot believe. It, oh, so there is more than just your oh uh, my God. conversation. Off, off the record with them at lunch and everything. He's an idiot. Wow. <clears throat> Tony Rankin. 
But what happens is <clears throat> every time you hear he lost his case, uh, no, we've won a slam dunk because when we come forward after the documentary and have fraud, no statute of limitations, you watch what happens. And that's what they're freaking out about because we have not had it yet. All they have is saying he lost his case. That's all you ever see. But you don't see what actually happened. And Rankin hands this back. And on that tape also, Steve, is the attorneys being asked, you know, when are we ever going to get this discovery? Yeah, yeah. Rankin knows he doesn't want it. He's not going to push for it. They respond, well, it's a moot point to ask for discovery, his classmate. Because we don't have anything. We don't have any drafts. There's no drafts, working drafts, or any evidence. We don't have anything. So it's a moot point to ask for discovery. While well, they told the public they had tons. And so you hadn't know, provided, you didn't provide the script to them at no, all? No, they got everything to Rankin. Everything. All my drafts, everything. That's why as soon as the case was thrown in April 2014, each of the defendants announced their work because they didn't get along very well. Wachowski's and Joe Silver and um, Warner Brothers all had problems with each other. And so they each announced their different take on the work. Joel Silver announces Oblivion being held by Disney. Only one that's being bidded is Joel Silver. And they had a novel as a cover story. They were writing a novel to be like, this is the source work, not Tom's work, but the source work here. They stopped the novel and said, we'll never finish it. They don't need it now as plausible source work to counter me. So they announced Oblivion. Joel Silver holds on to it. Lead characters' names, Julie and Jack. Julie and Jack are my brother and sister that sold out to Warner Brothers and Disney. And uh, in it, you have the pods, the identical figures at the end. You've got the um, little girl the pointing to the son, the man, you know, at the end, or daddy, all that stuff. It's all there. All there. So Joel Silver gets that. The take for Wachowskis, they actually announced in 2014, April, or yeah, April 2014, they announced it's too big to write down, but we just got a million dollar deal with Netflix for Sense8. It's too big to write down. You got a million dollars for not writing anything down. Right in the week that you just had the case thrown where you had all of this in hand and all my notes. Wow. What did, War what did Warner Brothers do? Warner Brothers bailed out Sony for The Great Gatsby. Way over budget. Nobody would help them. Sony steps in. We'll help you, Sony. Uh, the oh, one, sorry. Brothers, the one from 20, uh, 2013? Yeah. Right, DiCaprio. So what happens is Warner Brothers steps in to bail out Sony. Nobody would. We'll help you, Sony. So Great Gatsby saved by Warner Brothers. Yay! Right in time for 2014, where Greg Silverman, who is the prodigy of Joel Silver, and where did Robinoff go? Robinoff was the one that butted heads with uh, Joel Silver. On this overthrow, since the case is being thrown, Joel Silver takes kinship of Warner Brothers. He's the king, the star, after the biggest shakeup in Warner Brothers, because this case was thrown, Warner Brothers, Joel Silver gets all the power, he puts Greg Silverman in place, Robinoff sent to China, I kid you not, China for a 30 film deal in China, I think it is. And so it shows you how international relationships are not what you think. It's a billionaire, billionaire's club. It's not a war going on between nations. It's a billionaire's club. It's one big yacht to them, this world. And they just play this game with the public to distract with wars and stuff. No, they love each other. They're trading drinks and cigars all the time. Think of the bushes with the Arabs. So what you got is you've got um, uh, Warner Brothers then going, Greg Silverman's now vice president, president, whatever, of uh, productions. And so what happens is Greg Silverman, announced, Greg Silverman announces um, uh, Elysium. There's my work again taken. The other defendant, Warner Brothers. They get to free stock it with my notes, everything. And they do probably close to the best job of it. But Elysium, what do you have? You've got Bloomcroft, or what his name is, from District 9, who loved the work, he said. He said writing's like pulling teeth for him. But he loves the work because he loves the scene from this screenplay where you've got the barbed wire with the train station scene and the people peering through where they can't be in the elite area and held back and all this stuff. He loves that scene so much that he wants to do this project, right? Doesn't like to write. And so he does um, where you have the jack of the neck, glass, a shard, of, a little piece of glass is used to cut out the bad guy's neck, uh, hands from the back as in mine. It's adapted to him as in mine. So we can get to the elite section, which is in mine to download the thing to save the people, which is in mine. And it just goes on and on. Little girl even has the little girl scene where the little girl is her mom is being sexually assaulted basically by the bad villain slowly in front of the little girl as in mine. So on and on it goes while they overblow it, mocking it. The Jack, the, the thing that's put on the back of the neck, the adaption of the uh, Smith character in mine, whatever, to Neo, 
they use a big box on the back to mock it. Who puts a big box on the back of your neck if you're going covert? Because they want to just go big on everything. Everything's in there, Steve. Everything's in there. Even the part where they're looking for the uh, main baddie and or our guy, and he's got the adaption going on where he reads as that signature of that person he took from, right? Still on his identity. And so the, the pods, the pods are seeing that it reads out as somebody else. So they go away. That's in mine. So Elysium, Sense8, Oblivion, all ripped off at the same time. The defendants couldn't wait because they knew they had it in the bag. I would never be able to surface again. That's why they stipulated that we could serve the defendants. Why would and they went forward with those projects immediately after this case was dropped. That's right. With everything they were lusting after they wanted so badly to put in. It was the ideas that were new. What did the Wachowskis do? How they lift it off? How did they lift this work up? They took every scene they thought was cool. Their minds are not that bright. So they take every scene they think is cool, lift it, shuffle it around. So they used them as prompts. They've been using your script as prompts this whole okay. time. Thank you. Making it up on set as they go along. Now with Matrix 4, they finally admitted it. They finally admitted another writer was involved. They claim their excuse is, I've been saying it all along, their excuse is, well, Writers Guild only allows us two writers listed. No, you've had this writer all along, finally stepping forward for his glory in Matrix 4. And then admitting they're making it up as they go along. Who does that, Steve? Who does that with union wages on a set? Millions and millions invested. Who makes it up as they go along? Joel Silver in 2003 is quoted in an article saying, we hope it ties together when we watch the rushes. You know, the that would never pass. Like in the real world, well, like this is, I mean, <laughs> they're in a special club, like you said. But like when I was at Columbia College Chicago, you had to have a script before you got the cast and crew together. That's right. And a lot of the time, the cast and crew wanted to read the script before you went into production. So, so that's, why, that's why they made the storyboard. You're right. That's why they made the storyboard. What was Matt Damon shown? They made the graphic novel, right? Or they took the well, storyboards they, they and they... What they do is they make the storyboard of lifted images and they show that... Yeah, that's right, graphic novel. They show that to the actors. They're not shown a script. Wow. First of all, the Wachowskis and the others on the teams are too lazy to write it down. First of all, it's not their... Or second of all, it's not their work, so they're not interested in writing it down. So they just lift the images they think are cool. They want credit for those images. That's how, when you watch The Immortals, we make it the way it's supposed to be. That's a documentary. You're going to see all these scenes like Jack of the Neck, Liquid Mirrors, all that stuff that were lifted out of context. And you put it back. Now, keep in mind this too. The Wachowskis claim that on Matrix 3, on set, they claim, quote, everybody said to blow up the Matrix. Uh, why is there a debate on how to end it if you had it written as one? Yeah, if it's your story, why would... Why well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Already tight and true and proven, right? Tested. But no, they're claiming everybody said to blow up. They didn't. They didn't blow it up. What they did was they kept my exact ending, Steve. The exact ending. Which doesn't make a lot of sense when watching it. Not at all. Especially it does with, uh, with that Sati character, the daughter. Um, I mean, it seemed like it came out of nowhere um, when I first watched it. And I mean, I've watched it plenty of times since. But, um, yeah, it just seems so out of place. And uh, especially at the end, it, it just, why Why is this person here? Why is, right. like, it's just all, all of a sudden everybody's back there and there's no explanation. It's, it's, right. it's you know, poor little, piecing together of the story. Well, you know where the little girl actually comes from. On their fan site, they said this for the little girl. They said, little girl train station is just a subplot. Really? Where's the explanation? That doesn't tell us anything. And they said, let audiences figure it out for themselves. What really is the little girl matters. The little girl is so important. And I kept saying that. The little girl represents my daughter that was taken from me with my sons being killed. The little girl is integral to a satisfying ending. If you put the relationship back in where Neo has a daughter, that's why the little girl is so important at the end. The little girl at the end is his daughter restored to him. The little girl that he meets at the train station is a different little girl being pushed forward, reminding him of the girl he lost. And that's so much more impactful yeah. than having it just be... A, a creation of two AI creating a child, like what's in their version of uh, that third movie. That's right. See, they thought in the ripped off version that when they ripped it off with the script in hand and the storyboard, they thought that saying the little girls in the end would somehow make it magically work because the ending's powerful in the immortals. In this one, yeah, the little girl, the thing works. The little girl at the end, it's powerful, right? 
And you have the scene that Christopher Nolan used. Remember, Judy Nankovich went to Universal Studios. That's where Christopher Nolan is. Christopher Nolan was told in uh, writing school that he'd never make it as a writer. He went to try to find something else, you're never gonna make it. So he ends up at Universal Studios in charge of the Star Trek situation and all that stuff. And he does Interstellar. And Interstellar, they finally rip off the great scene from this where the little girl all ties in and that Wachowski's in use. So he uses it for his, and he ruined it, ruined it. He had the little girl aged with the daddy coming back and he's not aged and she doesn't care. And there's, she's just like nonchalant with family, oh yeah, whatever. That's not a scene, Christopher Nolan. That's not a scene. You lifted the image. Okay, you're going to take credit for doing it first. What's well, copyrighted? You didn't. You didn't get that one. Incidentally, Rankin was telling me he blew it again. Not just hand me the wrong tape recorder back. They picked a real crackhead. Because when what happened was he also told me that your copyright is going to have eight pages of scribbled notes in it. Your copyright isn't going to have this. It's going to have eight page scribbled notes. He's bragging. So I copyright. I contacted the copyright office right away. I didn't even tell the honeypot wife. I knew something was wrong. And I ordered this, 128 pages with everything in it. Thank you, Rankin, for bragging. Bragging is what they do. And they altered my poor man's patent, which is what you mail to yourself to show that it was created at a certain time as a stamped postal stamp on it. Leave it mm -hmm. to the field. They opened it. They had Rankin open it without me knowing it and claims that he didn't do it, right? They took out everything and put eight pages of scribbled notes in it. The problem is James Boyd of Norfolk submitted the material, script, music, everything, story treatment, preceding the poor man's patents creation. So if there's a script in James Boyd's submission and later you have a poor man's patent with eight straight pages of scribble notes that you've altered, doesn't make much sense. So here, James Boyd, submit my work. Yeah, I got a script, uh-huh. Story treatment, uh-huh. Pages, of, yeah, mm -hmm. here it all is. In it goes to 4,000 Warren Bird Lane and he has the tracking number, receipt, for letter, packet, everything, even the music. And what happens? They try to get around this by having Rankin call me and say, I talked to James Boyd. He has nothing. He doesn't have anything. So you don't have a case. He doesn't have anything. He's arguing for Warner Brothers. I contact James Boyd. He had everything. He sent it to me, including affidavit and everything. He had everything from 1993, June 25th, 1993. He had it all. So Rankin lied his ass off to try to get everything shut down for Warner Brothers, his classmates. You know, and how did Rankin and Linda Burrow from Call of Leslie and Proctor meet? Disney World. What happened was before we filed a case, right? And keep in mind, the honeypot wife, Becca Northcutt, her landlord was Anthony Rankin before she came in my world. Tony Rankin was her landlord. Didn't tell me that piece of information. Didn't tell me about having a criminal record. Didn't tell me about incarcerated in jail. So the deal was play Tom on a long con. You know, if you have a kid, oops, well, don't do anything with him. Say he didn't exist. And then at the end of throwing this whole thing, we'll shoot our things out there and you'll get instant success in Spokane, Washington from Southern California, Mike Lang. That's I, have a, I have a question. Uh, Does a, Is David S. Goyer involved with any of these people as well? Could the um, I think the writer of The Dark Knight for Christopher Nolan. That would mean he would know what's going on. Christopher wouldn't keep it quiet. He's very loud. So he wouldn't with his people. They brag. So he would know exactly what's going on, just like Keanu Reeves knows. You know, he knows what's going wow. on. Wow. Yeah, and I remember hearing um, you say about Keanu was um, interested in making the Immortals with you shortly before they put in uh, the Matrix 4 into production. Yeah, he had this in hand. He knew this. Now, he was allowed to be exempt from the 20-foot rule because he was going to be allowed to be a producer. That's how they bought him in the end. Now, so the thing is that he knows exactly what's going on. And wow. that's why he was employed to give the um, payoffs, if you will, mid payoffs. And they did a big thing to make it beneficial for him as a PR piece, saying that he gave the greatest charity act ever by giving... Um, millions making every cast crew member a millionaire overnight so they laundered channeled money through him to do the payoff and make it look like it was a benevolent thing and was it was his um wife and daughter killed on purpose or was that really an accident his uh one of his friends is a contact of mine and she told me that um yeah it was on purpose it was on purpose wow so um that then that um even 
the one party, I won't even mention his name, who's getting a lot of a plum right now and, and doing great with his trial was involved. So it's a dark, dark PR spin out there for all of them. And uh, yeah, Keanu Reeves, they just, yeah, he, um, he's got, well, one of the things he also did was during that charity thing, they called it a charity thing, is the stunt men also got uh, payoffs. And that was uh, brand new Harleys. Com claiming it's all through Keanu Reeves. Right, no, Keanu Reeves is being used to channel the payoffs from the deep shallow state. And so that's what's so interesting about that is that, yeah. But no, he, yeah, he, he's, he's a dirty character, very dirty. Wow. They just PR his image. They PR and him. like, <laughs> I've grown up watching these films that your work is used in, that it's ripped off in. And um, even Christopher Nolan's films, I've put on a pedestal. Like, I'm kind of ashamed to say that. But uh, I've used it to study and also um, give me inspiration for my work. And here I come to realize that a lot of it's thanks to you and your ideas and how it's... What's hard for me, Steve, is my sons never got to see any results of their dad's hard work. Never. I wanted to bring a family together. That little girl at the end, point the son, is my family being reunited. That my a father's wish as an author to reunite his family. So, but I appreciate you saying now like that it meant something to you. The work meant something. I wanted to whisper through art to make a better world. I really, really did. And even the text in there, Elon Musk with the neural link. The neural link is all through that piece, specifically spelled out. And the idea was it would help Alzheimer's. When he sees his little girl in the hospital, when Neo character sees a little girl in the hospital, she's got Alzheimer's and is aged 76 years old. She, he last saw her as a six-year-old. The idea is that he comes and sees her. He's not supposed to. And she's saying, a man pulled me out of the fire, daddy. A man pulled me out of the fire. We think it's a Smith agent that saved his daughter way back when he was assimilated into the program. And it's not. We find out at the end, that's why the awe moment for the audience is where they go, oh, now I get it, is that she points to a Christ figure. They just have it as a son. But he, she points to him, and she knows that that's, she says, that's the man that carried me out of the fire. It wasn't the Smith. We thought all along the Smith did something good as an audience. And that's the moment where the audience goes, oh, now I get it. Right, that's what's supposed to happen. Identical figures facing off the end. The architect's son with Christ. Wow. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah so they, the Smith character, um, the way that it's portrayed in, in the three Matrix films, uh, how far does that deviate from your work in terms of how, like becoming sentient and wanting to break out and not understanding like human emotions and all that? That's a great question. First of all, listen to this. Joel Silver got it wrong. In the meeting, there's a meeting recorded in an article. And keep me on track on this one because there's multiple facets to this I need to answer with together as a package. Joel Silver at the uh, pitch session when the Tosky are supposed to prove themselves they can write or direct and write, um, the, the suits sit down and go, we know we have something really cool here, but we don't know what it is. So that's my work. Even then they didn't understand it. They don't have the original author. Bonaventura feels he understands it, but he wants to be apart from this and cap and cash in from a distance because he knows he stole it. So what happens is it broke his promise about submitting it. So what happens is you have the Wachowskis unable to explain them. They get upset. One is called to the phone and is screaming, they can't do that. It's in the article. Apparently they're considering the real author still. Joel Silver explains to the suits and he's quoted basically as saying, Bob, you understand it's robots in the program. And this Bob character in the suit is saying, I don't understand it, Warner Brothers. I understand it, robots in a program. It's robots in a program. Joel Silver, you're full of it. It is not. Joel Silver doesn't understand it at that time because he didn't get a take on it. In the script itself, it says robot-like agents. Robot-like agents. And it's right here. I'll hold this up. So Joel Silver misinterpreted it. Right there. Robot-like agents, Joel Silver, not robots in the program. So wow. robot-like agents. I think that's where it is right there. Can you see it? You see yeah, the -like yeah right under the pink so slip that, there, yeah. That's what it's supposed to be. Now, what's interesting, Steve, is that when all the case is thrown, they brag about he lost his case. That's all you ever hear. <clears throat> no details. Don't go to more details. They don't want that. 
just be a simple public and go, he lost his case, look, nothing to see here, yellow tape, right, move on. So if we do look beyond, they get scared because there's a lot sitting there that's gonna go on their head if the public, a public actually uses critical thinking and look at it. So with Oblivion, remember Oblivion, he holds on to it and gives it to Jill Silver. What does Jill Silver do in Oblivion? No longer robot, robots in a program, it's robot-like agents. Tom Cruise plays a robot-like clone. So basically that's what happens. He gets it right finally afterwards. So um, give, me the, give me the question one more time so I can get back to the other tracks that are very important to it. Um, so well, yeah, the Smith character, um, was he supposed to be an AI in the program? That's Joel Silver saying robots in the program. The stakes are higher in the original one where you have um, the room of monitors, right? And get this, just quickly. In Kung, Fan, Kung Fu Panda 3, um, both dealer, um, what's his name? The guy that plays, oh God, Robert De Niro. No, that's not Robert De Niro's one. That's them. Um, Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman has been a total a-hole to me. And he was the one that I had picked during the pitch session to be the architect. I said, I want Dustin Hoffman to play it. Well, thanks a lot, Dustin, for your gratitude. Because what he does is he mocks it completely. This whole thing, you got the room of monitors here. And you also have talking through the eyes of the agent. In Kung Fu Panda 3, you, these are real life agents. The stakes are higher if they're real life. Because they're not allowed to show any fear or emotions. If they do, they're terminated immediately by being observed from the room of monitors, see? So what is, um, first of all, what does um, they do? What did what Kung Fu Panda 3 with Dustin Hoffman do? You've got this scene where he's talking through his eyes. Remember Bane in Matrix? And he looks in Bane's eyes and sees Smith? Mm -hmm. Right here, here it is. The, the best friend of Neo is a former agent with his memories erased. He's talking through the eyes of one of his former employees to talk to the Smith character named Behringer. It's right there. So in Kung Fu Panda 3, they have a scene that means nothing. They spend all this money on a scene where you have um, it going on and on and on and on. And it's all about um, talking through the eyes. In Kung Fu Panda 3. Oh, wow. With Dustin Hoffman mocking it. That's not just as far as they go. In Meet the Fockers, right? What does Dustin Hoffman do along with Robert De Niro? When I pitched this, I'll go back to your question. When I pitched this to Bonaventura, he said, what do you think about Robert De Niro being your Neo, your main character? I said, I'm not against it. He said, who else do you see in your cast? I said, Dustin Hoffman for the architect. All right, you ready? So in Meet the Fockers, you have Robert De Niro and Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman plays that he only has one ball. Why? One testicle. Why? Because Hitler only had one testicle and he's being cast to play the architect. The architect's Hitler. As our oh, boss, wow. Of course. Yeah. Why Robert De Niro? Because Robert De Niro is who they pitched. He was in town, they said. Barnabasura said. How about him for the lead? So what does Robert De Niro play? Captain Jack. My dad's rank. My dad's name. Who's he married to? Diane. Jack is my brother, also married to Diane, who is related to Spielberg's, cousin to Spielberg's, Ben Burt, main man, Ben Burt. Kind of a pun there on Rain Man. Wow. But the thing is, like, that is how bad. And then what does Spielberg do to mock me even further? Spielberg is one of the worst in this, along with Disney, that wanted to destroy and capitalize off this work. Do you have share screen? Uh, yeah, let me get that going for you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, right. you should be able to go. All right, let me get on there. So keep in mind, Spielberg did all that, right? And we're going to go to share. Okay, this graphic before you right now is Spielberg again. Spielberg again in Minority Report. Tom Cruise again. Tom Cruise, Minority Report. Tom Cruise plays Captain John Anderton. 
Captain, my dad's, what was, what was Robert De Niro playing? Captain Jack. My dad's uh, birth name is John. He goes by the name Jack. So Captain John Anderton, my dad's official name and rank in the Navy. Anderton is the spinoff of Anderson with T for Tom. Anderson, another little further joke by, they all try to be clever. And Anderson is our Scottish clan name. So Captain John Anderton, Anderson. What is Tom Cruise's character going to be put away for? What's the pre-crime? That his son has been murdered. So he's going to be, he's going to commit murder. So that's a 302. He's going to commit a 302. That's what I keep getting hauled off on, 302 claims, that I'm going to murder my son. So what is the son's name that Captain, my dad's rank and name, and our Scottish clan name, is going to, why he's going to commit murder? Sean. What happens after 2002 when, when uh, Spielberg makes this graphic? My son Sean is murdered. And I'm told he's murdered. And they try 302s to put me away, just as Spielberg predicts here. Exactly. Can you get more better than that? Let's look at the graphic here real quick. Upside down for a split second. See how the page is turning in the corner? Look how it's blurred in the corner here. It's turning mm -hmm. it's in for a split second, a millisecond. Keep in mind, Susanna Bolgen, the graphic designer said that anything in for a split second is for the uh, uh, director's eyes only. This is actually inverted right side up. It's, it, it's upside down. So it's in for a split second upside down. You have Thomas A, my name in Anderson. Keep in mind with Spielberg, it was my dad's rank and name. Here it's my name, Thomas A. Anderson, Scottish clan name. But they don't leave my dad out. John Anderson, right here. John Anderson is the father's name. This is from The Matrix, the first graphic in it. Wow. So John Anderson, our Scottish clan and my dad's name. And then Spielberg picks it up with John, Captain John Anderson, adding my dad's rank. See? And then what you have here is, it's mind-blowing. July 22nd, according to records in 1996 to 99, when this was, graphic was made, my birthday was July 22nd. So the Wachowskis correct it in 2003 to July 2nd, 1959, exactly. Then you go down to something else that's pretty wild. The schools, Owen Patterson. Owen Patterson is a production manager. There's always the joke, they'll name a high school after you. Well, ripping off our work, Owen Patterson gets Owen Patterson High. The other school, Central West. I graduated from Central West High. Then oh, Michelle, no, McGay, no. Michelle McGee is the mom. Michelle McGee is the art director. Keep in mind, the Wachowskis blame Michelle McGee and Owen Patterson for this graphic with all my information when they claimed that everything that went in the Matrix was their doing only equally between Larry and Andy. So they're trying to distance themselves from it. In the column, it would say, it says TA4099, bold. TA was 4099. They got that right. I was 4099. But you got the birthday wrong because it was wrong on the records at the time. This is the first graphic they made in the Matrix. 380, the only thing that's missing? 380, Steve. They claim they're into numerology. They're not into anything. They're into, I mean, they couldn't even put their own diapers on. It's 11. Yeah. 380 numerology means that you are, your most precious worldly possessions are being taken to prepare you for your death. Does that work nicely with Spielberg's 302 attempts and claiming that I would be put away? Here's my license. 7259. 7259. And look at the clock. Yeah, that's intentional. <laughs> and there's the, there's the age there too. Okay, leaving share screen. Wow. We now, got them all they have is saying you lost your case if people are smart enough many are to look beyond that talking point and realize what actually happened in the courts there was no case there was no due process there was no chance in court it was a railroad job with everything plus like the art of war that they can say nothing to see here in fact the judge that was put in place that was hand-picked for this was gary klausner gary klausner was appointed the first appointee by former President Bush, by Pat Robertson's, he's called his dream team, as we called it, Bush's dream team, the Law and Justice Center with Jay Sekulow put Gary Klausner in place. Why? Robertson says, Steve, so he won't be a second-class citizen. So conservative decisions will be made, which means decisions he wants, regardless of evidence. In MSJ's motions for summary judgment, where if any piece of evidence is there, you're supposed to proceed. I think we saw some evidence, but they just simply say nothing here. Nothing here. Throw it. 
Wow. It's so frustrating to even think that these people would do such a thing to you. And to go this far, to just plant all these seeds among all these different works with other people, just to like, just to mock you, like I said before. That's right. That's why they did it. That's why I would never have known, Steve, these entries were there if I had not been called by a gentleman from the story department who wanted me to know. I wouldn't have known. I would never have known. Well, I'm not going to look through a film for every split second. I'm not going to. I wouldn't even know if anything's there. But when I got called after this is bringing, coming out, they're throwing our case, he called me. He felt bad that they were doing this. And he told me, look here, look here, see this. And that's not all that there is. In Animatrix, what was Animatrix? Why Animatrix? Why do you shoot two and three and then at the same time on set shoot Animatrix? Because they're lifting everything they think is cool from here. And they have a storyboard to rip off, like you said, make it up as they go along. And then what do they do with what they didn't get to put in the film as they made it up as they went along? Where Joel Silver says, we hope it ties together what we did, Jake. Put it into short animated series and use every idea you haven't used in shorts to get credit for it that way. Yeah, I think their explanation from what I recall is the, um, the prequel shorts that are in the Animatrix, that was going to be either a two movie deal after the first one or they do two sequels or no it was like a se a prequel and a sequel or two sequels and uh obviously like that hodgepodge. They, they weren't planning any of this like they no, didn't know no, what they were doing that hodgepodge doesn't tie into anything it's a whole all over the place thing of just i want this idea credit for it this idea credit for it. the one where the kids come down and their nose bleed just before they hit the ground yeah i have the thing where they hit just before just before they hit the ground they stop the thing where they had the detective story is used for all my insert material to mock me. In fact, there's a, something in it that says, you'll look, but you won't find it. It's whispered over it. And in that scene, you see Tom Park Althouse across the screen backwards. They change an antique shop graphic to an antique house graphic to put my name exactly across. Park in the middle. And they use Mopar a sign of Mopar tiny in the middle that turns into, with crossing a line across it, Tom one way, Park the other way with a ghost K. Tom Park Alt has across the screen. Wow. I never finished your question where you, we were talking about um, the, what was it, the um, little girl? Yeah. Smith, yeah, yeah, Smith, yeah. The Smith transvert, the transgen. Uh, yeah, the Smith too. Yeah, with the AI, uh, if he was supposed to be in program only, or if he was. He, he's supposed to be a real life person within the program. And he's the one that is brought to Neo counterpart to offer him the program after he's brought out his, uh, the pods, right? I had the pods too. And he's being told that, you know, I'm to orientate you to your new life. He hates them. And just before he entered the pods, uh, Neo was told by his best friend popping up the back, becomes the Morpheus. The house, his house had been firebombed. His family's dead. What's going on? <clears throat> because he's got the, mole, the jack thing on the back of the neck from the interrogation scene, <clears throat> he pushes his best friend out and says, you know, stay away from my family. He rejects his best friend, which comes back to haunt him later. They didn't lose the scene that haunts him later, but I think it's really cool. And um, so what happens is you have this situation where um, um, first of all, one tangent of this is like, it's pretty cool is in the future when he's brought back orientated by Smith, his best friend has been a former agent. His best friend says that he still has, even though his memories have been erased, he still has residues of memories of what happened to killing children and that it haunts him. Enter Josh Whedon, who wanted a piece of the pie, who came into Universal Studios to save Waterworld project over budget again. And this seems to be the go-to thing, save, bro, get in there with credit. And so Josh Whedon had my script because Keith Wester, the sound guy in charge of sound, had my script. He wanted to see it. And so here comes Josh Whedon. And after that, he does Dollhouse where the memories are erased, but they still have the thing. And Josh Whedon in his courses even says he lifts material. Everybody does, he says. Wow. So what you have is, it's just one big thief, den of thieves. And so... Yeah, that don't they don't have brains. So, so I, just... I remember you mentioning uh, in an, an earlier interview that 
you're you didn't have the pods acting as a energy uh generator for no. the machines absolutely not the field of pods they remember how they like you said they look at the images they think are cool mm-hmm. then they stick in what they're familiar with like the ghost from uh the train man from ghost and alice in wonderland as they make it up as they go along they stick these things in so the pods originally were supposed to be the architect bringing back his top 100 but making sure it's safe by testing on test subjects called secondaries who match his top 100 physically. So one by one, they're brought back writhing in pain, spewing and all this kind of stuff. And they keep that idea, they keep it. But to justify what they do, they say it's about power, right? About getting power and they hold up a battery. That's to mock, obviously that's to mock. I'd be surprised if audiences didn't realize that's a mocking thing. Who's gonna hold up a battery? Why would Morpheus go, here's a battery that you don't, know, that strike you? Stupid, it's dumb, it's juvenile. But the thing is like, look at that. Battery power, like I said, you can hook up bovines and get more power without dealing with you know free will so much, right? For animal lovers, I'm gonna say so much. Rather than humans, get more power off the engine of a cow. It's got a bigger heart, boom, boom, boom. There's your, there's your piston engine. You don't need humans, that's stupid. Yeah, that really oh, doesn't yeah. make sense at this point. It was like, all why? part of the mockery. Yeah, it was all part of the mockery. And they ruined the, the reason those field of ponds there in the original, it's also sets up for the whole thing where the solution balance the equation, what's at stake. Now keep in mind that in the field of ponds, you have this thing used to redundancy. It's so it makes me sick every time I see it. Ah, it's in um, Game of Thrones, it's in um, Walking Dead, it's in all these, these guys just keep using it. Avatar, the ripoff by Cameron of the poor people that actually did Avatar. Um, they use my stuff mixed in too, but it's not the fault of Avatar people. It's James Cameron. But you have this all the time. Watch this. See if this is familiar. <laughs> that stupid freaking thing that I have in mind that was to be a one shot deal. The architect comes back to life. You zoom in and the eyes open. They are babies. I see it everywhere. Yeah. They're babies in Hollywood. They just keep rehashing everything because they don't think there's anything new. I can't tell you how sick I am of this game, of this freaking game of rehash, 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 and try to be clever. And they just put different spins. It's like the Schwinn bikes from long ago. We put baseball cards on and we try to oh, put it on here. I made a different sound. I'm going to add this to it. It's still a Schwinn bike. You didn't, <laughs> you didn't do anything really great, guys. You put a baseball card on it. So, yeah. So the architect, yeah, the, what's supposed to be going on is the architect is a problem in the program where his mind's going to atrophy from lack of stimulation because he's immortal. That's it. So simple. But the Wachowskis can't grab that. Again, watch that Bound interview they did. You know, it's like, listen how they talk. Listen how they talk. Yeah, you know, and could you, could you elaborate on why they're dressing the way they are now? It's part of the deal. Warner Brothers has an agenda. It was made known to me. The agenda is to push um, transgender, which is also in the screenplay that I have, the original. But it's there for a reason to propel the story along. You're supposed to, Wachowskis, propel your work along. The scenes are there in a certain order in relationship to propel the story, not to be lifted out where they just somehow fall in place and keep an exact ending to do it. So transgender and also the idea Warner Brothers is pushing get a long way with their crimes and all their buddies in Hollywood to get away with their crimes is the idea that we're all dark. We're all evil at our core. And only the honest ones are coming forward and admitting that. And our children, everybody's supposed to realize that, that we're all dark and evil. And of course, if you do steal from each other, then you're just following the laws of nature. You are surviving by preying on the weak, which is what you're, you're, they are your food. And the honeypot wife told me that she told me, Tom, you're never going to make it because you're too compassionate. You're never going to make it. They're not going to take you because there was a deal apparently going to be made. She knew it, and she was crying to me, going, they're not going to take me. She's going to cut out her job. They're not going to take me because I'm not pretty enough, so they're going to take somebody else and give you a starlet. Yeah, she knows the system really well, doesn't she, Steve? Spilling it out. What a scene. And then told me, the only way you'll make it, Tom, is if you understand the laws of nature. The weak are there as our food. She actually said that. She wow. Actually, yeah. She actually wanted to order human steaks from India for us to consume to get the idea I told me that's where you get them online i don't want to be part of that world i don't neither do i give me a classy woman any day 
who's smart and that's who they're afraid of. Classy women who are smart. They don't want that. Hollywood keeps doing these scenes of the woman, like, like I said, Iron Man uh, two or three where the sexy journalist comes up and she's, and she's like, I'm serving you a subpoena. It's like, yeah, well you're served. Oh yeah. I kind of like that. And then Iron Man's in bed with her because he, this woman who wants to take him down goes to bed with him. That's Hollywood's projection that they want all the time. That any beautiful woman's going to go for them. What were the Wachowskis promised? Wachowskis were promised when Gina Laurentiis wine and dine them. First of all, why do you wine and dine them? They didn't have any body of work. Plastic Man Carnivore still not done. Failed at everything it did. Well, read comic books. Their mom said that was it. So why is he whining and dining and promising beauty, star, beautiful starlets and all this other stuff? You know, why? And why is he promising him beautiful starlets? You know, so the idea is that if you're with the Hollywood group, you get beautiful women. I was told the same thing. I'm like, I want to reach a world. I want to make a difference. I want to work through my art. You know, if I want to go to bed with somebody, I haven't had a problem with people coming to me and offering. I want to do great work. I don't need your help, you know. So I don't want your Barbies. Uh, so the, the red pill, blue th pill thing, mm -hmm. I know that you'd mentioned before that it's it was reversed in what yes. they produced. Yes. But it, originally, the blue pill was a good thing in yes. your work. And a painful thing. It was like this. I'm glad you brought that up because, Steve, yeah, what they did was they inverted that. It was one of the biggest snow jobs ever for the public, and they still don't understand a lot of them. Of course not. How would they not know? So the red pill, of course, I made the red pill bad. The red pill is the only pill you're offered. I'm glad you brought it up. Remember how they insert what they're familiar with into the film as they make it up? So they inserted Alice in Wonderland, eat me, drink me. They inserted that. It doesn't propel the story. It makes no sense. You don't need a blue pill if you're offering the red pill. It, 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 you can offer the red pill and then just like, okay, fine. You don't need the blue pill now. It'll just wear off. The red pill is only offered by the elite to enter the program. And you take it. If it's offered to you, take it or your family dies. You die. You don't have a choice. The red pill gets you immortality in the mortal program. The blue pill is the bootleg pill made by underground. If you take that blue pill, you will be able to enter the program and survive in it, but you have very painful side effects. You're going to suffer. You're going to age very slowly. It's going to be miserable, hard, but you'll be able to do your job. That's a true blue pill. That's, if there's a price to pay. That's a hero's price. If you're going to do this, and boy, if I feel like I took the blue pill. And everybody's talking red pill, red pill. And why the blue pill? Because everybody was talking about the eyes. They're always talking about the blue eyes, blue eyes, blue eyes. So I thought, okay, if maybe if they're talking about the eyes so much, I'll use a connection that has been familiar in my life, a blue pill, the blue pill, because they called it blue saucers. So blue pill. And the funny thing, Steve, is the reason I picked pills, I mean, why isn't it an injection, right? A shot. The reason I picked pills, and I'm not going anywhere with that, I'm just saying pills, is because I didn't like shots. The author didn't like shots since I was a kid. So I did a pill. Now look, at it's always a pill. It's always a pill. Do you think, you know, at the time in 93, would it have been a pill? Probably not. It would have been an injection. But it would give you yeah, that. And that would go along with the narratives they're trying to push right now, actually. Yeah. It's crazy. So, yeah. So that's why it's a pill. And look what they did with it. So now everybody's, I mean, people say I'm red pill, red pilled. And people have all, all over the place. I was told by Hollywood uh, Connection, you know, say redpillrising.org. Use Red Pill Rising. So I did, but it's actually the blue pill is good. The blue pill is the one that, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. And doesn't that make sense? So what they did was they took the one that represents revealing them and made it the good one. Wow. Man, there's so much that, that you shared today that I'm <laughs> I'm having trouble kind of trying to keep up with with everything, but um, yeah. but uh, yeah, I mean, well, see, this is this is what it's supposed to be. Here we have that pill, the pills being offered, right? Mm -hmm. This is what it's supposed to be. The world has been so snowed that when they get the truth of it, and we have the evidence, do we not? I mean, is there any debate on these things? Is there any debate at all on these things? Anything, you know, like look. Anything? Any debate? No. Did they overkill it? Yeah. So I've had hosts say, I got to take a vacation. I have to take a vacation after this. We have been so, it shows you how much they kept back where people who have created, like I have the Neuralink, I have iPod in there, the liquid mirrors, silver liquid mirrors. They are the security device, at the train station. People have been held back from the truth so long by a media connected to a um, 
underground organization of, I mean, dirty work that they, it's like a mind blow when they actually see the truth. And, but it means that opens us to a new world where the truth is gonna reign and we're not gonna have this garbage by poor whimpering little boys that are snowing the world that are actually afraid themselves. We don't have fear. And the phrase that um, the best friend of Neo in the piece uses, who had his mind wiped, is no fear. Because if you show fear, you're terminated in the program. They learn how to function without fear. I've learned how to function without fear. To be fearless. You know. And they don't include that in any works that I can think of. That doesn't seem to be a message, no fear, that they want to get out to people. No, they want fear. You're right. And they want everybody to be dazzled by them. They thought by lifting all the images they thought were cool that everybody would just be blown away by them. It's almost like, here's our candy. We stole it from the candy store, but here's our candy we stole. And everyone's supposed to go, oh my God. And the Wachowski, like Larry says, his big thing is he's like, everybody buys me drinks all across the planet. Wherever I go, they buy me drinks. Well, that's your thing, but that's stolen work that did it. His wife, the Dama Matrix, we left Thea Bloom for, is Dama Matrix, where she said she'd never go with a client. She said she was going with him because he wrote the Matrix. Guess what? He didn't write it. He didn't write it. You frauded your own wife. Wow. And he still hits on women everywhere he goes. So, yeah. Um, I do have a question about um, John Carpenter, the director. Um, is he also in this club with these people or no? What did the, John direct? What did he direct? Um, the most famous for Halloween. But uh, he also made the the film They Live with uh, Rowdy Piper with the sunglasses where he put them on and he would see um, ba basically aliens that are actually running the world. And when he takes the glasses off, they look like regular people. That's an interesting, interesting concept. I don't know the facts on that one. I don't know. I can tell you this, though. They're shipping a lot of stuff overseas. In Russia, um, they had a series called something like They they are better than us or something. And they used, they used the immortals off the charts, everything about it, all these things about the relationship between his wife that was taken out and, you know, um, who begat the daughter. It was, take, it was in there. Everything's in there. Everything's in there. So they took it to Russia and just had a field day. When Joel Silver's first move with the um, uh, immortals after he got to Bonaventura is to ship it off to Ghost in the Shell, the director from Ghost in the Shell. He ships it over there for 1994 rendering. And all that director did was lift the images of the Jack the Neck out and illustrate them, Jack the Neck illustrations and genderless people and all this stuff. So that director of Ghost in the Shell became a partner to ripping off the work to be a plausible source material, they claim. That's why the Wachowski say, we want to do Jack's Neck for real. So they don't waste the time. As soon as they get the script, as soon as they get this piece, what they do is they ship it overseas and they give it to um, directors to benefit off of that are bad guys overseas. The director goes to jail as a jerk. And so he's using this material to get fame just by doing illustrations that they can claim it. So that's why in Oblivion, uh, they were creating the source material and then stopped, didn't need it anymore. I think that's quite telling, you know, for Joel Silver. There's another Tom Cruise movie called Vanilla Sky. Mm -hmm. You know about that one? I haven't seen it, but I heard about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically it's, he's, he's living in this like artificial reality mm -hmm. and you, you don't find out until much later in the movie. But right. uh, I'm, I'm curious if they actually pulled a few th things well, and ideas from that, from your stuff as well with that funny one. Thing is, as soon as I had heard that title, I knew something was wrong because when I was pitching things, they were saying, you know, what influenced you? What meant so much to you? What, what affected you? And I said, the earliest thing I remember that really moved me sensory wise was there was these um, caps that came off of um, these drinks and on it was these um, baseball players and stuff. And it, it was like these vanilla drinks and there was a blue sky, this beautiful blue sky. And that was, became my favorite color right then at an early, early age, and it smelled of vanilla. And so I was like, that was my, wow. I shared that sensory experience. And then to see vanilla sky, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. In the credits, be clever. they play the song Mr. Blue in the credits. Interesting. So the kind of, <laughs> I could see some connections with that. Right. But um, the, um, it's interesting, the music that was submitted, um, the music for the Immortals. Uh, this yeah. Is the, this is the copy of the original tape. 
where I submitted um, um, In the Lap of the Gods by Alan Parsons was the opening credits. And it really fit. George Michael's praying for time was to be the uh, end credits. That's why he was murdered on a Christmas where they say his heart gave out code of the industry for in the movies as he was murdered. And uh, because he's a witness to the script being done in 93, they don't want a witness to the script being 93 because the Wachowskis weren't given the uh, title to it in 90 until 96. So he, Rankin, again, not being very bright, Tony Rankin on Maui, he's claiming, you know, well, you know, you don't have anything before 1996. Well, you're ravishing my materials, but yeah, I do because certain people step forward with the old copies that I have. So yeah, you're wrong on that too, buddy. Um, in the lap, uh, the other one is Immortals Transport. It's an original song they're very upset about because they actually use it, pieces of it, in the heart restarting scene with Neo. So Rankin, again, Tony Rankin was used and employed to destroy every copy of these. He wanted every copy, never came back. He destroyed them all. We found this at my mom's um, storage place. We found this. And so we have the original, this is the actual original copy uh, made side by side by the one that was submitted to Warner Brothers. So in this tape to this music, you're going to hear Yanni, that star from under the Warner Brothers label, Yanni with the long mm -hmm. hair. Yeah. He uses this in 1993. He uses the Immortal Transport exactly. All he does was add some harmonica. He uses the exact song. So Yanni rips us off through Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers gives him our music as soon as it arrives. He puts it onto his album. Music industry, a big ripoff. A lot of musicians out there know that. So they took our music too. They couldn't resist. So I have nothing good to say about Yanni whatever his real name is. Nothing good to say about him. Yeah, I remember he was really popular in the 90s. Yeah, he thought he was sexy. So he was the cheapest, one of the cheapest men I know. Wow. Wouldn't want to meet him. Wouldn't want to hear what I have to say. I'd probably be pretty shallow, just like the Wachowskis. It's all image. And Joel Silver also created that online series, Altered Carbon. Right, and that's where it gets rough. That's what my son was killed. My second son, our first son was killed over. Was wow. Like, that's when the car ran me down. And as soon as the car missed running me down, Joel Silver took his name off the project, being done in Canada. And that's where Trudeau comes in. And then what happened with us was Trudeau's administration and uh, where they wouldn't let us leave and then claimed we were being deported. Things claimed that my son and I, and it's in writing, are attacking Canada. No, we're not. How can a... 12 year old at the time and his dad who just writes and is trying to survive attacking Canada. Yeah. What was their basis for accusing you of that? Yeah. They, they, they claimed that I was attacking Canada. There's no basis. <laughs> and the thing was that he put his attorney general equivalent in charge of me, this woman in charge of me. We got a special notice given to me by the car that ran me down. A Mazda charcoal gray SV five shows up after running me down at the front of our house on Christmas Eve at 3am in the morning. That's not time to de deliver government papers. And it pulls up on our sidewalk, onto the sidewalk, our side. The woman runs up through the snow, drops in the mailbox, and it says that Trudeau's uh, um, attorney general is going to be assigned to us. On Christmas Eve at 3 a.m., and that car goes right down the street and is there. Same car that pulled up outside of my uh, shared copyright holder's home, taking pictures. Charcoal Gray, SB5. That's what ran me down. And so what happens, my son calls me, Sean calls me and Aiden talks to me. That's what happened. Glad you're alive, dad. Stay safe, stay safe. He's starting to remember what happened at Roberts' organization when he was like reprogrammed with these social workers, they call them, and uh, to hate his dad. And so he's telling me this stuff about, you know, stay safe, dad, I'm proud of you. This is like a first time conversation we get to really have. And after that call, he was killed on the highway, police involved. Um, and I was called by a contact. It was, a, it was to be a joke, death, by using um, X Files death, the snowplow. So he's killed by a snowplow. The snowplow in the article, driver's name's never mentioned, nothing. You see, I finally saw a picture, he's cremated. I finally saw a picture where the doors just dented in on the passenger side. How's that instant death? Because the police took him out, agents. The police are used in our society when called upon, needed upon, by the chief of police working for the FBI. The FBI is with Hollywood. They're supposed to be protecting the writers. They're protecting the studios. More profitable, more to gain, more prestige. So they protect the studios. That's why it's laughable whenever you see movies start with the FBI warning. The FBI warning is to writers. It's not to studios. Basically, it says, you know, the FBI will prosecute $250,000, whatever, in jail, whatever, jail time. That means that if you're a writer and you're trying to take your work and claim it, you're going to suffer because we're standing for the studios. We'd make more money and get more prestige that way and get better tickets and seats. Wow. That's yeah, I always thought that was a warning to the viewers. 
like it's supposed to be a view that's what's posed as but in the industry it's actually you know, like you guys are effed you you anybody out there is effed don't don't mess with studios it's it's a it looks that way and they're big on that but it really doesn't mean it that they, they never follow through on protecting writers they won't they're there for the studios so yeah and don't don't steal work don't copy this work don't do that it's for the studios that, you know it's, it, that's what a warning is the warning is audiences don't take this work they protect the studios not original authors so yeah but they are involved in controlling the chief of police and things like this for the hollywood groups and for who runs the show the banks that what really is is uh, quantico bay or no, quantico military base in virginia is where they take those chief of police and you have to be selected by the FBI to come. And if you're personally selected, all you need is a high school equivalency, not even a college degree. And you're brought in. And you just do some sessions where you're going to be loyal to the FBI whenever called upon, when there's targets in your area. And you're given a yellow brick. Yellow brick. Alice one eye. Oh, I'm sorry. Wizard of Oz. No, Wizard of they're big on that, the man behind the curtain. So really, they, they're so, in trying to be clever and in all their bragging, they laid a trail so clear that people that are actually geniuses, that were tested as geniuses and done the work, proved ourselves, can just blow it out of the water. That's why they rank us, those of us out here that do this work, in what's the biggest threat. And they work top down. So that's, what, that's why my two sons are dead. My, sister, my daughter bought to the teeth where she's actually with the other firm that threw our case. She's married into that firm. She's married into the firm that threw our case. Isn't that something? Yeah. Rios and Associates out in Pasadena. Rios and Associates from Texas. Ralph Rios, who got all these rewards, threw our case, was a handoff firm for Rankin and Warner Brothers, all classmates from University of Berkeley Law School, uh, sends Jacob Rios, his relative, to marry the daughter. And, and you have one son remaining that they said uh, they're not going to touch. They're not well, going to do anything. Well, I made uh, a statement that I would destroy the work I have that they haven't seen if anything happened to him. They said, you can't do that. It's on the tape. It's a, it's a fascinating contact tape where they're going like, you know, you can't do that. You can't, how do we know you have a conversation? Just play his day, play his day about, you know, your son. And he even says on it, you know, we you know you're concerned for your last son's safety. And that's why the cars are pulling up and people pulling up and threatening you like the charcoal grays are pulling up to let you know, quote, they can get to your son anytime they want. It's yeah. supposed to make me stay in line and not say anything and not talk like right now. My son is so cool. He's like taking advanced classes for college credit as a sophomore in high school. He's the youngest one in his class. He's advanced. Wow. He's done so well. He plays piano. He plays soccer. He does it all. He's an incredible kid. He's with me all the way because his mom didn't want him. He was, he's a product of a job in her mind. Right. And so what happens is, you know, what, what mom does that, you know, said he wasn't supposed to be born. And so he's the one that said, you know, dad just keep going do the interviews put the word out don't stop and he says he even said if anything happens to me you keep going you don't stop don't stop do it for me finish this you know do it for people and that's that's his heart he did a piece on redpillrising.org he did that uh father's journey he called it didn't know he was doing it put it forward it really encapsulates the total feelings to you of everything everything that he felt and went through i didn't know i was just like oh my god including the loss of brothers and it really capsulizes it. So what do they do through Sophia Stewart and the others? They have they call me and they tell me that, you know, you're making him up. He doesn't exist. He didn't do it. He doesn't exist. You don't have a son. They're actually trying to claim that. Now they do this because they can actually carry away the idea where, keep in mind, July 22nd was not an accident. When my records in 1996, 99 showed July 22nd, it's because they changed them. They erased all of the records. I didn't even have a social security number. Everything was gone, erased. At that point, I didn't exist, false birthday. They're mocking it. So the Wachowskis are mocking like Rankin was mocking. Oh, time. that's why they put the 22nd instead of the 2nd. That's, right. that's right. So okay. I, I would not exist. And uh, that would be, that's part of their big thing is immortality, being remembered. That's their legacy thing. They're all about that. Robertson now, uh, Michael Eisner from um, uh, Disney. They're all about their legacies now as they get older. So the thing is like, that's what the worst thing is to be forgotten. You'll see it in the films all the time. You'll be forgotten. Uh, uh, Aya Stark says it in Game of Thrones to the one guy, you know, uh, to the fray, you know, you know, you'll never be, or the one guy, you'll never be remembered. You know, no one will remember you. So the thing is that that's the, supposed to be the worst of all. And so I was supposed to disappear, never exist. Aiden was supposed to disappear, never exist. 
And the 302 thing was employed by Spielberg and them by bought, buying the family off and board they get rewards. Brian Fitzpatrick is an FBI operative lifelong, uh, also Pennsylvania Congressman. How's that happen? He's Hollywood FBI and also Congressman PA who has my sister daily with him. My sister turned for the rewards, went off the charts. She had called me one time and said somewhere along the line, she screwed up. Yeah, you did. And now she's all about black tie dinners. She parents is on Warner Brothers own programming like CNN, Jimmy Fallon show. She gets to travel to the Caribbean where Trudeau had gone on the yacht. She gets to go to London and she's an unlicensed elementary school counselor. She gets to black tie dinners. Like I said, she gets to um, be mentioned on the floor of Congress with a picture held up by Brian Fitzpatrick, who is a very scary guy who's working with Trudeau's administration that actually undermined Ukraine, set it up to, for the fall. He's the one who was in charge of it. So yeah, wow. yeah. Yeah, we have the article with him involved. So that's, that's how this works. And it's like, um, we hold all the pieces. So that's why I'm top of the list. Like, it's funny because I played FBI's America's Most Wanted and they said they caught the guy, uh, Charles Witt. And so they caught him. And so there's residuals and the FBI gave me a card because he sent every courtesy to Tom Oldhouse. And here I am on their mo most wanted list. As a good person, they want to take down. I hope they never succeed. I'm with you too. I, I, I mean, we, we share a better world. It's going to, you know, if name credits restored to the work, name credit, just like what happened with Marvel Comics and uh, the Bill Fingers family with the Batman situation. It was paparazzi that turned me onto that, that cared. They actually cared about what's going on and actually want me to write their movie at some point. They turned me onto that documentary. It was Marvel Comics, Marvel Comics owned by Disney. So, right from Rat Robertson's initial submission to Disney and Universal Studios, where the players got to have their takes on it right away through his own people. You have Marvel Comics with Disney um, finally giving name credit to the Fingers family. And it was Becca Northcutt that told me, the Honeypot wife that told me at the time she was shaken up about she was gonna be removed, that Warner Brothers and Disney and uh, Marvel Comics had a bigger thing they were dealing with right at the point that was too much for them. That's why they were possibly gonna make a deal with me, is what she was saying. And it was um, uh, Marvel Comics is also the ones that Wachowskis were picked to first steal the work through as a comic series. That's so, still possible for you to get name credit for your work? Absolutely, because awesome. the truth coming out, because the word coming out like this. Now they struck a lot of interviews and they'll say all kinds of weird things. They strike it all the time. Sophia Stewart will call me and tell me they're struck. She mocks all the time. Sophia Stewart was a person put in place out of USC, just as the director for Albert Carbon, as you said, was brought out of USC by Joel Silver. And they're put in place to be first claimants. The public thinks there's nothing else to see here. The first claimant gets credit. Uh, the person who actually writes it doesn't know what's going on. That's the whole point of the plan of the art of war. They don't know what's going on. The first claimant's brought forward because they're put in position to be that. And it works on the public often. And uh, what's interesting about Alder Carbon is the claim of Joel Silver. They claim on Netflix, they'll even have a blurb saying, it's the greatest sci-fi concept ever in the history of film because it's the rich have immortality in the future. The poor is used as pawns. That is exactly what this is that's the whole premise of this and then what they did with warner brothers one of their take of course you know so they did through crunchyroll which is out of university of berkeley where these attorneys come from and owned by warner brothers at the time yeah channel track to sony which is their partner for crime and what they did was they did a series called uh, darling in the franks and again the premise was the rich in the future have immortality the poor is used as pawns they're each taking the work as they want since the cases are thrown. So every time people hear he lost his case, keep in mind, it was a strategy of art of war where there was no case really. It was a complete railroad job with the judge picked, everything put in place, deadlines thrown, everything's thrown, got the work and then stole immediately again. And that was it. It was all part of a fraudulent thing. There's no statute on fraud. Oh, I just want to touch briefly upon George Lucas. Oh. Now I know he sold his work to disney yeah but um was he also a victim of the system not a victim no okay you, you see the um remember the star wars films and all you've got the one with the cloning where the guys asked about you know he has one son he wants on alt unadulterated and not touched and, that, and then the, the aliens don't understand the cloning agents don't understand that that's right for my work that's what the architect does. He has one son, they took it out. One son, he names Wagner, who is um, untouched. And that Wagner is supposed to be grateful that his other siblings were eliminated. And he was chosen as the only one that was most naturally genetically matched to the architect. Wow. <laughs> Lucas is a scumbag. Sorry. They yeah, all I'm, I'm sorry too. 
They all wear sheepskin. They all wear the sheepskin. It's all about image and the sheepskin and under there are the wolves. Yeah, they've really romanticized the whole early um, upbringing of them being filmmakers, uh, Spielberg and Lucas and how they wandered onto the sets and whatnot. Like it's, it's really romanticized, especially if you look at the biographies of them and everything. Yeah. But all, when you look when you look behind the mask of all of this, it's really it's gross. It's a absolutely. Where we're supposed to believe something that isn't so. Our world is not what it appears. And the real people behind the scenes, the ones that actually wrote the work, just think what happens if name credits restored this way. I want to open the doors for those people too. I met a lot of them. I know who they are. They contacted me. The woman that actually wrote Gravity. The people that actually did Avatar. The people that did um, even Kill Bill. I know these people. And it's like, what happens is you've got a situation where you'll have a golden age in film. Our whole society is gonna rise through entertainment being what it, with layers to it, with actual feeling and passion. It's like the Solomon baby idea. Which one cares for that baby more? The one that allows it to be ripped in half, like the Wachowskis ripped it apart by lifting the images that were cool, taking away the story and destroying it, or the one that actually cradled and nurtured that boy, baby and uh, loves it and knows everything it needs and, and wants to present it to the world as a being. Yeah, and I view film as an art, and it's um, it, it's been bastardized. Like I, I really haven't watched too many films over the past decade, just because of that alone. And the stuff that I have watched, uh, it's mostly been from recommendations of friends, or if they want to watch something with me at the time, mm -hmm. then that's what happens. But um, mm -hmm. I have a, a short collection of films that I always used to go to say like the, this is a real work of art i want to make something like this same here that's what um, you asked. originally you asked what sources did i originally admire and it's only the only thing really that i really admire is what's pre matrix because the industry just took all my work and just kept shredding it passing it around like a phone book that's why there's so many um titles under it like original subtitles is because that just kind of shows you how many studios were interested and having this work and keep in mind that Wachowski's did not use one of these subtitles they wanted to slap back at um bringing another writer in to finish assassins they were so mad about that they went all the way to writers guild west and wanted off the project name off the project they didn't want that because they were arrogant about it and angry and so joel silver at that time offers them the science project and that assuages their feelings and now they're allowed to do what they want with it but they don't use one of the titles and they stick all those things in the inserts to slap back at warner brothers for having brought another writer in and De Laurentiis. And so what happens is, what's interesting is in the end of that series with all those copyrights, you have a situation where I go out to Hollywood in uh, 1996 uh, and work with Ellen Gear, Will Gear's you know, daughter at the, the theatricum there. And you see what happens is the Immortals title again, copyright office, the subtitles again, even more. And you see that no longer is De Laurentiis on the project. He runs from it at that point and puts it in the investment firm's names so those are the largest investment firms in the world, basically, for Hollywood. So the investment firms are claiming they created the immortals. How do investment firms create creative content? That's not their forte. They suddenly get a bug for creating work. So it's listed as created by the investment firms. A screenplay blockbuster created by investment firms. And that way, they have the same subtitles, no body of work, right? Suddenly, they're going to write something at some point, apparently. And... Anybody that has a take on the work, the investment firms then give them that uh, stolen material. The people feel safe to take it, like Josh Whedon, and they can do whatever they want with it, like Lucas. And the investment firms make money by giving it out. So they feel safe to take it. Every time the investment firm who claims ownership gives out stolen material, they make a profit, big profit, with the owners and the financiers. What a sweet deal. And they have the slots of the office. It's a complete racket that needs to be revealed. If you want a good story right there, just how much they snowed it, John Grissom, many of them, wow, there it is. There's the story. And we've got attorneys from Hollywood going now. This is the real life story is the big one. I'm not trying to promote it or plug it. I'm just saying that's what they're saying. They're saying they got goose flesh over the story. Better than Matrix, they said. So that's why I think I'm still alive and Aiden's still alive. We're considered assets and valuable investments. But they would never include themselves in the story that they want to tell about you. That's right. Because it would incriminate them. They cleanse themselves out and leave the rest in. They have control of the ship. Wow. And those offers have been being made. What they're stupid about is 
I record calls like that. I got the contact stopping me. Bob Iger was fired because he was supposed to call me. His assistant said, Bob Iger's calling you tomorrow. He's going to give you a call. Be ready. He wants to talk a deal, whatever. So that's on tape. What's interesting is I did an interview and said that night and said that, you know, there's sex rings at Disney, whatever. And uh, we are going to be hearing from Bob Iger. Bob Iger is fired the next day. He is fired. And not only that, in the same time in the newspaper, it says there was a sex ring sting on all these lower echelon pedophile employers, employees at Disney parks. That's a big PR risk to do that. They don't do that unless it's absolutely necessary. What they don't tell you in the article is they didn't do a sting on the medium and upper managements and the execs of the sex rings. And if there's all these lower echelon doing it, you bet your butt there's the upper echelon doing it. Do you think, like, do you know if that's being worked on to get these people uh, like charged and arrested for having these sex rings or there, they're just oh, free, free for all for right now. That's the thing about being the writer and the industry knowing you're the writer. And then they call and brag and say, we know you actually did it. Even the returns will say, yeah, we know you wrote it. And then being back to bashing and throwing everything. That's what's so wild. The ones that said, you know, you lost your case and we won are the ones that came to me and said, we know it's your work. Even in the testimony in the, uh, or in the um, deposition I had, the Warner Bros. attorney that's a classmate from University of Berkeley with Tony Rankin, they're trashing me, says, given the fact that you wrote The Matrix, oh, strike that. She even says it on the script or the deposition thing. But the thing is, um, there's a whole myth going on and I've been told about it, where the military is gonna save us, they are not going to save us. The Pentagon is very much involved in this for the studios. They're all in the pie together. It's kind of like a candy store where they all came, or a birthday party, they all came running around the cake. So it's like they're no saying they're going to take care of the trafficking, but they're really not. No. Wow. You'll see a couple people, a couple kids saved, and there'll be headlines on it. FBI saved 20 kids. It's a cover story. The FBI is the one that always comes forward and says they do the investigation. Nothing to see here. They did it with Twin Towers. They did it with um, the Cuban embassy where the sounds were going off in the ears. Yeah, and said nothing to see here. Could be if they get caught. It's the FBI. The FBI was involved in Ukraine with um, Brian Fitzpatrick and all them. And Canada Trudeau's the FBI equivalent. What are they doing in Ukraine? Well, that's foreign soil. But they excuse it by running cover, cover articles that say usually we don't go to foreign soil. Can I share screen one more time? Sure. Yeah, go for it. All right. Let me go back to this one. Where are you, buddy? Here we go. Okay, I'm going to share this screen real quick. There he is. Okay, I got him. Okay, share screen. This shows you how big this is. Here's the article. This is a cover article with Brian Fitzpatrick. He looks like Pee Wee Herman or a bad Mr. Rogers. But the thing is that in this, it's, it's a cover article locally for cover why I was revealing how he's involved in this stuff. So they do a cover article. And they'll say things like, you know, usually, generally the FBI doesn't go to foreign soil. Yeah, you're not supposed to. And it talks about how they destroyed this man's life, Shokin, Shokin, Victor Shokin, who is, a, uh, it says, you just, you just equivalent of the United States Attorney General, right? So this Shokin is destroyed by Fitzpatrick, using everything from taking electric property, ruin the reputation, make calls, destroy them. Why? Quote, he wasn't pushing for reforms and he wasn't working fast enough. So he's removed. Wow. His life is destroyed by Brian Fitzpatrick, who has my sister in bed. Well, doesn't have him in bed. He's actually gay. My sister brags about that. Sorry to say, but he does. She brags. He's not married. He is part of this sex ring thing. So here is a congressman who's a lifelong FBI agent involved in this ring who has my sister in bed from Pennsylvania, who was serving, they claim, to 2014 in the FBI, which is when he becomes, uh, they start putting him into congressman. He's lifelong FBI, by the way. 2014 is when our case is thrown. So he becomes attached to my sister to handle her daily with all kinds of rewards where she brags about getting remodeled kitchen with the most expensive ranges and maid service and everything you want, trips to where you want it, black tie dinners by this man, everything. This man is a blight on our world. He is being used by the elite to destroy everything, uproot everything. Claims he's bipartisan and... Watch what happens. Watch what happens with this man. Also, here's the plaque behind the chief of police from Warrington with the FBI yellow brick. You got to see it to believe it. Right there, yellow brick, FBI. Wow. The guy's a goon. He's the one that sent the uh, SWAT team helicopters our way over our house after they lost on their 302 attempt on me. 
There's the FBI flag. The only two images that show up basically online about him have the FBI behind him in his head. Very proud of that. This is me on a 302 being hauled off on a 302 where they said I was going to kill my son. What's interesting here, look at the Twin Towers. The Twin Towers, you have a man testifying what happened. He saw it coming down. He's bloodied. Who whisks him away as soon as he's testifying in the middle of it? FBI. It's all together here. I know it all. And so what happens is you also have this thing where here's the thing on the FBI and the film warnings. Yeah, they're in bed with mm -hmm. Hollywood. I get messages all the time. This one that said that, um, uh, what was it? The FBI came Saturday evening for four hours on a Saturday evening. This is a woman who was um, planted on us and the FBI came to her for a Saturday to turn. She then says that I can tell you this, they're watching everything you do. Tom connected the dots. We have everybody, even uh, um, Sophia Stewart says it. It's unbelievable. Terry Joyce text. Terry Joyce was an interviewer, low, lower level interviewer. She had like 500 followers or something. Sophia Sorry. Stewart's that one that is pretending Clinton. that Love she... Yeah, yeah. Matrix. she's assigned to me she, right from the start. She had called me at one point and said, you are the um, missing link, Tom. You are, um, you can claim Matrix uh, 2 and 3. I claim Matrix 1. The reason she said that is that's how they would throw the case. And it, uh, if they needed to go that far, they would say, Tom um, didn't claim Matrix 1. Therefore, any matchups in Matrix 1 can't be claimed in Matrix 2 and 3. Therefore, there's no matchups. It's bullshit. Bull garbage. Sorry. Here we have Teresa... Uh, Joyce, she um, was contacting me, did five interviews with me saying, you know, this is all true, everything else. Then she says, there's a lot more FBI is in on this. I've been approached by them, a group of people. So then she turns on me and that is done on the anniversary of my son who had been killed. Here they are running at Quantico. Notice the demographic, all basically middle-aged white guys. So the FBI is picking this demographic. This is the demographic they're picking to do their bidding. And all they have to do is jog, look at the strides here, jog, walk, crawl for a couple miles and they get their yellow brick award. And that's how they work it. And they will be faithful. Now, keep in mind this, here's what happens when they fail at a 302 um, and the next day they send this. These two helicopters circulated for 20 to 30 minutes over my house, directly over two uh, SWAT team helicopters. From that guy I showed you with the yellow brick behind his head, they put in the papers they'd be doing maneuvers to cover it, just like they said in um, the Twin Towers, they'd be doing maneuvers. But watch out, there's a flagpole in my mom's house. Here comes the helicopter right overhead with the mound on front. These two helicopters, two helicopters circling the house. They're perfectly synchronized, perfect synchronization going over the house. And then I'll swing here to the other one. See that? Directly over. Circling, exactly circling. This is right after the failed 302 attempt where they really couldn't put me away. It's been happening all day. All and my sister gets the award on the floor of Congress her picture held up by Brian Fitzpatrick. Here's the other one. Watch it come over, it's gonna come directly over. This is done all the time. Oh, here's the second one. Second one, watch out, flies over. This is supposed to let you know they can get to you anytime they want. It's like the car is pulling up, like they said in the, in the tape, that they can get to you anytime they want, that you know it, and it's supposed to show you this. There it comes right here. Look, look how it's right overhead. Right over top. See? Oh, yeah. Right wow. For 20 to 30 minutes. Just Way going go over and over again over the That's house. Right. Who, who sent them? Yes, all right, just over our house. Who sent them? This man here. Who has he worked for? This man here. Who disrupted Ukraine? This man here. Who is my sister in his employ constantly? This man here. Where is he originally from? Hollywood, California. Lifelong FBI operative. And became a Pennsylvania congressman with my sister. What did my sister get for rewards? President of all psych people in Pennsylvania. Um, top psych person in Pennsylvania. She's an unlicensed elementary school counselor. You don't get worse than that. Now, Brian Fitzpatrick is sending out support. Send me money, send me money. I'm being slandered. Really, Brian? <laughs> you want a congressman saying he's poor, he needs money? Are you serious? Really, buddy? Wow, that... Brian. That's quite something to see, though, all that. I didn't know Fitzpatrick was involved 
like in that much of an aspect to all this. So he's, uh, he's the number one go-to guy. He's the number one go-to guy. In fact, he's been given positions as ways and means, everything else, top positions in every single thing. Um, so he has, if you look at his list of what he's on right now, there's a clue to one world order. He has got all the top positions. Congress is the power in the world. It really is. Um, and they can get, get anybody to do anything with the FBI. They can do anything they want. The, um, the one world order also wants to have a one world currency. Yeah. Uh, do you know anything about like, are they using crypto to do that as well? Cryptocurrency? I think you're going to see cryptocurrency fall. Well, I might, that's just a guess, but if you see it fall, I think it was something to mislead masses. And um, there was such a push on it and it sounded so good. But just like they have the Federal Reserve that plays, you know, got rid of the gold standard, just like they have this idea where invest, invest, invest. When you hear a lot of hype, it's usually a bad thing. Yeah, and there's no known creator of Bitcoin right now. Beware, um, beware, yeah. beware. Whenever they entice you into the pen and put lights all over the gate to enter, don't enter. Don't ever enter the lit up gate. Yeah, that's good to know. And I, I know there's there's people that are invested in it right now and just experienced uh, a lot of uh, turmoil. I even heard some people took their lives the other day with a, oh. with a recent crash. So the, the coin was like valued at like $120 a piece. And it's now down to like 0. 0.0003 right now. Right. right. So people lost their entire life savings. Um, I think some of them had collateral loans out too. Right. And it's just really sad just to, to see the people talking like that they were going to like get rid tell. of themselves because they don't have any hope. And it's like this, I wish there would be somebody that would, that would help bring them out of that. We will. We will. What's going on is right now with the current power structure, it's all about power with these guys. The context that's all about power. They said, I won the chess game in this. They claim that I won the chess game. That's a lot of pressure on an individual. But the thing is that um, I have survived the gauntlet. I've gone off their playbook. They've thrown everything they can at me. Death of my sons, everything else. They even mock me saying that I don't feel it. Yeah, I do. Of course I do. But I'm going to finish the job in their memory. I'm going to help others in their memory. They don't. They underestimated the power of compassion. If you have compassion with power, you're not going to be corrupted. So absolute power does not corrupt absolutely if you have compassion. So what's going to happen is the power is over this side. Those of us that actually have survive the gauntlet, have a heart. We're not in position yet because they haven't allowed us to have our position yet. They haven't fallen yet. So right now, don't take anything from the medicine show. But when we become into power and are seated in power and name credits restored to those of us out here that actually have the chops and did the right, we will couple up with people that are actually good people like yourself and then look at what's optioned as investments. Look at then look at what is available to you. Not before, right now the house is on fire. You don't try to buy a room in the house when it's on fire. When we survive this and get this done, when we do, then rent a room. We'll give you a suite. It'll be good and it will be sweet. We're going to, we're going to, we're, yeah, not yet because we don't hold the reins yet. They're still stealing our work and saying he lost his case. When that goes away, when the helicopters start flop, stop flying. Let's talk. It's going to be good. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's. I wish it wasn't so far away. I wish there was a timetable. We it knew. Steve, it could happen like that. As soon as name credit's given, and negotiations are happening off and on, as soon as name credit's given, I mean, is, it, is there any question? I say again. It would collapse their entire house of cards. Any questions? Any questions at all? This isn't going on now. I was to, my phone's actually owned by AT&T. It's owned by Warner Brothers. So they're not going to go on it. It happens all the time. Stop. Anyway, the point is, yeah, is there any questions we have? There's so much we have, even though they tried to alter things. Now that works against them. But yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. I bought this converter cassette to MP3 that I can finally, after decades, put this music on, on digital. A, yeah, and, and uh, pass it around and what they feared most. And Tony Rankin, when he first approached me, came to me with the Honeypot Wife. He kept pushing. Where's that music? I need to have every, is every copy? It's like Kevin Spacey and like, was it? Confidential, LA confidential. Where, you know, is this the last copy? Is everything got? It's foolishly, I said yes. And then this turns up. This is their worst nightmare. Their worst nightmare. Music is that 
a stamp. They even said, proves it. When they were trying to give me the copies of it. Give it to me, or tell me your journey. This proves it. Yeah, well, I have the copy still, Tony. I still got it, buddy. Awesome. I'm glad that you're thinking about how this is going to, like, just like that, it could happen where like, everything will like, go into your favor. Like that. Yeah. You watch the rats run. They're already burning papers and getting up out of their seats. There is a lot of chairs being thrown around the boardrooms. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, just looking at some of the, the news recently with uh, what's going on in Hollywood, it's like, it seems like they don't know what to do right now. Well, get this. Mike Lang was assigned to me from the beginning by Michael Eisner, who's concerned about his legacy now, tied directly to Pat Robertson and Joel Silver and Steven Spielberg and Lucas. You've got him putting this in place in 1993, everything Art of War in place, Rios and Associates, right, handoff firm, with Jacob Rios to marry the daughter. You've got Miri Espinoza, his paralegal, is related to Lenny Coco who is Nadia Centino, a student of Robertson, brought in probably for this purpose, right, as a student, and never taking any classes, coming forward and saying, my father-in-law, give the music, his best friends of Bonaventura, nice and tight, nice and tight. Mike Lang, keep in mind, Mike Lang, when this is done, takes the honeypot wife to bed, showing his bed with a shaving kit on it, and also um, uh, the big L in front of Lang's on Howard, uh, to have the wife come back to him after he throws the case. Can I show you that real quick? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Share screen. Let's look at this. They don't like this. In fact, whenever you see, the reason um, Harvey Weinstein was brought forward was so that no one would look at Mike Lang, his boss from Miramax Films. So when Miramax Films, when he leaves, keep in mind, Joel Silver leaves the same time Mike Lang does, the same time he leaves. And he draws away without someone to replace him. It becomes Harvey Weinstein. And what's really interesting is the Variety article goes on to say things like, you know, um, that Miramax has this library. Here it is, library, 800 million in 2011. Uh, it's gone up and it's in a Jersey warehouse. And uh, Film Tracks is where he's going to go as a consultant now to continue the process of the strategy to acquire intellectual property they don't own my work. And then you get this thing with Joel Silver leaving at the same time, 25 year relationship. When I've come forward in April, 2012, when Rankin, Tony Rankin is running the clock out on serving him, right? And they stipulate to go ahead. That's when Joel Silver leaves right there. When Mike oh. Lang leaves, right? Pretty telling, isn't it? Yeah. Here's what he sends the ex, uh, the Pot pot wife, this picture of the bed, he's moving into his multi-million dollar Soho club, uh, in Spokane, Washington, the most expensive, historic, oldest historic property in Spokane, Washington, Playground, Hollywood. And there's a shaving kit on the bed, not even made. Shows he's moving in, right? To his mistress pad. With the words, Becca, move in with me for 60 days. It's, it's unbelievable. And if I go right here, where is it? This is so important. This is what they struck from our, um, oh, what was it? Our, our devices. It was actually erased. I'm looking for the Mike Lang article right there. Hold on. I don't see it right there. Okay, so, but he he actually writes the honeypot wife um, a move in for 60 days. Anyway, I'll find that later for you. I have that actually. They struck it from all my devices and we just happened to have it. That's frustrating and put it on there right there. Okay, wow. but yeah, so he writes that to her. It's just, it's absolutely mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. So I'll jump back out. Is this it? That's no, not it. Anyway, that's another uh, guy that was thrown my way to disrupt. I have a lot of people that are paid to disrupt. And that was started with Pat Robertson's group where they actually started with former security guards that work with the police. They try back and forth, become police officers, get better pay for Robertson. And the police are involved in the crimes. And so Pat Robertson um, started with security, ex-security guys being a charge to be anonymous, to approach any business, anybody that likes you, anybody, that's their job. They're paid like $30,000, $40,000 a year to go and contact anybody that may associate with you and you lose all your jobs you lose all your loved ones. Are you in California now or no? Texas. Texas was Texas, the safest okay. place we could go. Yeah, we were chased all over the way by, uh, by Fitzpatrick and his goons and the police under Fitzpatrick. I would call police on a break-in. They'd say, we're not coming out, not coming out. And... Um, like you're saying, you did it yourself. I'm like, I just, what? I have the evidence. Here's the pictures of what's happened. No, 
they wouldn't help you because they're under, in fact, Rios and Associates, who had his nephew or whatever marry the daughter, uh, his uh, receptionist was a 9-11 dispatcher. And when I showed up in California, she went back to dispatching. And it was her, Christina Colon, who handles my call when I needed a crisis a call for help or the break-in. And she said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. The very receptionist from the firm that had his nephew marry my daughter and had the paraleg uh, um, paralegal married or um, related to Lonnie Coco. Unreal. <laughs> it's the story of the lifetime. Yeah. So it's like they... They just tried to come at every single angle at you to Art make sure that they were controlling your life in every aspect possible. Art of war. Art of war, they call it. Yeah. But I don't think the art of war would have said, do it so blatantly. Such a tight circle. If you put the pictures up, strings attached, it is a small circle they did. And uh, all the studios wanted to cash in. That, that pop right entry is so telling because you've got so many studios involved in this theft process. They thought that would give it protection you know, to them all. No, no, it's going to be, once we get um, name credits established, documentary done, things like that, we'll go after these guys. We'll go after these guys. And they know it. And they're, they, they take, but the contact says they're afraid of your power now, Tom. And I said, you know, that, that uh, they only understand power and they're afraid of your power. You've won the chess game. They keep going to chess game. Well, I'm looking forward to you taking them down and uh, your redemption overall. And, um, and just for you to be honoring your children that they, they, I can't believe they did that, that they, they took them away from you, mm -hmm. literally took them away from you. Then mock and brag through like Sophia Stewart calling and bragging and mocking about it. Yeah, that's her job. Sophia Stewart is not the mother of the matrix. She is a person who failed at writing and was brought in to do a job. They take D players, they call them and put them in position to destroy the actual A players. Yeah. And I, I admit that I fell for that story when I first heard about Sophia Stewart. It was crafted well, but there was no substance. Yeah, it was just like the story was there. And then there was no follow up and I never heard anything more about it. And I kind of I brushed it off because I didn't believe it. But uh, it was out there. And um, thankfully, yeah. through um, I think it was. Uh, I think it was Titus Frost was the first person that I, I watched you um, talk on his show and um, that brought everything back around and I just started digging in more into all of this and um, well now here I'm talking to you and I'm really glad that um, that we were able to have this conversation and, and the, hear everything from what your experience has been with all this. Well, in memory of my sons, I appreciate you doing this too and for the effect we can cause. There are those of us that are compassionate, aren't there? Yeah, and we want to see a better world, and we've just been held down. They they have a strategy of knowing who is who is the ones that really could be making a difference in our world and leading it, and so they actually crush that infrastructure. They crush those people. They don't want us connecting. They don't want us working together. They don't want us bringing that better world. So this is not the world that people should be seeing. This is a hijacked world, and Elon Musk, even him, it's like he is a figurehead giving being given the work. He doesn't even understand that work. But it's all about polish. And even, in, like I said, Iron Man 2, they show him as a cameo, as a reward. They give cameos to people. And so they get, show him like, yeah, you see Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't even understand Neuralink. He doesn't even understand it at all. I heard him talking about it. It was like kind of like Mozart going like, oh, my God, this kindergartner is trying to explain this stuff and does it so badly. It's That's where the frustration comes in, listening to people like Elon Musk talking when they have no clue. And the Wachowskis, no clue of what they've been given for their Glory. No clue. They don't understand it at all. Intellect of a P. Wow. And that's coming up more and more. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, just a lot of stuff didn't make sense. Uh, I mean, even over the years, seeing just the way things progressed with the Wachowskis, um, I think Larry started dressing differently much later than Andy did. And, yeah, um, and he was, yeah, and he was the last pick. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to be that. But that was that was because they went against. The, they were not supposed to put those inserts in, and they were going to let it go if it was never known. But since we brought it forward, then they had to pay a price. Wow. And no. Keanu's family was also part of that as well, like uh, paying the price is like connected uh, Keanu, to the well, similar. Keanu, 
but for what I understand from Keanu, I think he was trying to cut um, liability. So that's why family, I, that wasn't to uh, keep him in line. He was part of getting rid of them. So oh, wow. yeah, okay. in mine is to keep me in line. In his, he's getting rid of liability concerns. Have you talked to him about that at all? We Has have, that ever come we've up? We've been connected. I was emailed. We're supposed to talk. And the one party who was his friend had said that he freaked out when he heard the title Immortals. And um, he's afraid of that coming back at him. He knows full well, you know, that, you know, he's he ripped it off. He knows that. And he saw the script on set. Yeah, they're using fear to keep him away from you and, uh, and just he's coming out with the truth right. of everything. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Like in Game of Thrones, too, they say this, too. They stick a lot of their pieces in there. They really do put their thoughts in there and try to be clever and it is that people only pick the team that's successful and so as we succeed you'll see Keanu Reeves come forward when we succeed and then he'll want to be on a winning team not until then it's too risky he could lose his image too many questions to answer to public and would you accept him coming out with the truth of like with what happened with him if that time comes, the boat. He missed the boat. Not with two dead sons. I'm never going to let that go with Keanu Reeves. No, he's he's he belongs in a in a hobo situation. He he should take his because he's knowingly and, participating in all yeah, of this. Yeah, he he belongs where his talents um, fit on the street begging. He's not worth a dime. Don't like him. Nothing good to say about him. What he did to my sons, because he did. He might as well pull the trigger. Counter is trash. Wow. Scumbag. All imaged by the suits at Warner Brothers. In fact, it was the suits at Warner Brothers that came to the table with the Wachowskis and said, you're going to use Keanu Reeves. It was the suits that made Keanu Reeves Neo. Because he wasn't doing so well with Johnny Lightning and things like that. So they were making sure he'd have a career. Because why? Why would the Warner Brothers suits that do all this horror want to give Keanu Reeves a career? Because he's willing to do the dirty. He'll go along with whatever they want for success. That's not my kind of guy. That's a scumbag. Not with children suffering. Nothing good to say about him. Yeah, not, I don't have anything good to say either. No, he's a joker. He does wow. the drugs. He hangs out with his biker buddies. He's a play. He's just nothing good. There's nothing there. Nothing there. One of the worst people in humanity. That's why they gave him the idea, that article, if you see that article where it said that he did the greatest charity act ever. Steve, how is it charity to give union wage people on a successful film shoot millions of dollars? How is that charity to make all those guys millionaires overnight? What about the poor people in that city that don't have anything? What about giving them a million, Keanu Reeves, you idiot? That's how I feel. You didn't do a charity act. You laundered money. Um, when do you think uh, the documentary is going to be completed? It's on you... my shoulders. They're, the documentary team is stellar and they have been waiting for me to keep sending the information. So we're sending information and information through while systems get disrupted, but they're getting the pieces and everything together. And it's a gold nugget field, Steve. It's just like, oh my God, like those inserts I showed you where the phone won't go on now. It's like they're blow away nuggets where in the Bill Finger story, it was basically like a set that just had the one guy saying that, yeah, he said he didn't get credit. That's what they used in order to get their credit. We've got, oh my God, what we have. High school and everything. So it's like, I mean, matchups off the charts. Only one matchup does it. So it's up to me to provide all this material to them. And then we wade through it and figure out how to construct this together. And the team is absolutely amazing. And the team has been approached multiple times by characters employed to throw this off. Anonymous, as they call themselves, have been approached. And they keep they send me these messages where they keep approaching and saying, don't work with Tommy's evil, don't he's fraud. Uh, Sophia Stewart language, you know, these guys like Royce Babcock, they are in position with the FBI to do this. They pick lower echelon people that failed in their career and can't make it on their own, as explained to me by White Hats. And they pick them and then they suddenly feel so great and wonderful because the FBI contacted them. <gasps> we matter. We're important. So they, they get drunk on it because they couldn't make it on their own auspices. So they work for the FBI and feel like they're suddenly the most important guy with a lot of power behind them. Yeah, they fed their egos. Totally. And that's why these deep players suddenly become like they are. And uh, then they approach the studios and approach uh, the documentary team over and over again, trying to look for anything that would drive a wedge between us to keep the project from working. And oh, I'm glad it's still on track. It's on track. Awesome. 
yeah, I'm glad it is because, uh, I mean, I, I do believe it needs to get out there. And, um, I mean, take all the time you need because, like you said, you have a lot of material to put it together. And I know some – I have a documentary on my hometown and it's, it's maybe five hours long. I got to cut it down a bit. There's just so much content. I might have to split it up into different yeah, – Part like, two. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good for but, you. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, no, it's good to hear that it's, it's moving along. And even though you're having roadblocks put up that you're still able to, um, to move forward with it and keep well, keeping yeah. everybody on track with it. Thank you. I would say this to the Hollywood elite. Um, they like to call themselves elite. Every time they pull the chair out from me, they say you're one of the elite now. I'm like, whatever. So I would say this, you say that you're all about power. You say that it's all about power and that's all there is. And you underestimate the power of compassion. You blew it. You should stop doing this to families because what happens is those of us that actually have compassion, you can throw everything at us and you would crumble if it happened to you. Yeah, it's just a fragment of what you threw at us, you know, or me in particular. You would crumble. Instead, those of us with compassion end up dedicating it to our son's lives and memory. So we never stop. You created monsters, good monsters that are never gonna stop. And I am proud to be a monster that's never gonna stop. And if I'm your worst nightmare, I will continue to be forever because I will not stop because of what you did to my sons and what you do to other people's children. So just a message to the elite if they wanna jump out of some more buildings. Yeah, and those with the compassion hold the most power as well. That's right, and compassion has an other side to it too. I've learned, I was before I had said, you know, no, let's all just, everybody come together, we're all important. Now I say there's certain people that deserve to go. Absolutely. And that compassion has another side to it, the fierceness of a parent's compassion. And when you take a son's of a parent, just like Spielberg mocked in Saving Private Ryan, in Saving Private Ryan is fictitious story based on real life stories. And so he chooses the characters' names. And who does he choose, Steve? Sean as the son and Daniel as the other. Kirk Daniel is my son. Sean is my son. Thank you, Spielberg, you idiot. So what's happening is they underestimated the power and the fierceness of a parent and that they don't want to see other parents go through it either. And in the Game of Thrones, they spell it out there. They say, they see, at the very least, certain characters like Cersei and these others and uh, Stark Lady is about, you know, their fierceness for their kids. Yeah, I have that fierceness. You took away my daughter. You took away my sons. And you threatened my last son. He was attacked a number of times. I will not stop till Michael Eisner is revealed completely and broke. I will not stop till Joel Silver is revealed. I will not stop till Spielberg's revealed, Lucas and Wachowski's. Yes, I have said over and over, let's do an on-air thing where we debate about what it means. Let's bring forward the Solomon baby and talk about what it means, where it came from. They couldn't do it if they even tried. And so I will continue to offer that. Let's have an on and on. You did a full thing in TMZ owned by Warner Brothers. They're turning for Warner Brothers that handled me also is turning for TMZ. Now I'm turning for Netflix, laundering machine where Walter Carbon is. And so that Linda Burrow is also, they did the article through TMZ, came the whole staff wrote it with Wachowski's faces and quotes mocking me as a know-nothing hack, famous for nothing. Let's go Wachowski's. Let's go up. If I'm a know nothing, nothing to be afraid of, let's have a debate about what it means. And I'm going to keep putting it out there. But thanks for letting me do that. Again, anybody go to the Bound interview, look up Bound Wachowskis and see how they sound and tell me if we won't articulate that through. Now, Trudeau's administration put forward that I mumble all the time. I never make any sense. Nothing makes sense. I have no evidence. That's Trudeau. That's you were really eloquent with your speech. Yeah, I mean, there's no, as far as I have heard, no, you haven't mumbled at all. Well, they would claim oh. complete mumbling, nothing, no evidence presented. That's how Trudeau works. Yeah, you're really organized with, with all your information, and you clearly know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's my baby. And you know what? I look forward to people actually understanding what the Matrix story is supposed to mean. The immortals. The immortals. That's what, you know. And it's interesting. From Hollywood's standpoint, those that put this in position, it would not be called Matrix. It would be called... Army of Darkness and 346 other titles is what they would refer to it as. <laughs> Not Matrix, because the Wachowskis want to get back at them, as I said. They want to get back at them. The Wachowskis caused so much trouble, they were forced to be made to look like women. Because they caused so much problem. There's a price to pay in the cartel. And that's why Mike Lang has had his head on the chopping block, Steve. He had to brag. I asked the contact, why do you take Becca to bed? Why do you do it? The answer, his ego. 
So we would never have known of Michael Eisner's involvement. Michael, pay attention. They do watch our programs. They do. They have people watching our programs. That's why they get so affected. Michael Eisner, we would never have known about you if Mike Lang had not taken Becca to bed. We would never have known. So we're coming for you through this properly. And we're not going to stop because of Mike Lang. And you can take him off the table and don't put him in articles. Even run articles where, you know, Harvey Weinstein, da da da, and at a boss, you're not going to name him. Mike Lang, Mike Lang, Mike Lang. That is the one who facilitated intellectual property ripoff. His title was basically executive in charge of strategy for acquisition of intellectual property under Michael Eisner. So that's, there it goes. That may not sound so impactful to many, but when you know the story, it hits home. Michael Eisner is the father of intellectual property ripoff through Disney, who first instituted it through Mickey Mouse, where Mickey Mouse never became public domain. They forced it through copyright laws or copyright offices to get perpetual ownership of Mickey Mouse. They broke copyright laws initially. They are the father of intellectual property ripoff. And they put Mike Lang in position in 93 to make sure to facilitate. And here's the solution. The solution to the complexity that he talks about in the Variety article, how to get these things he doesn't own in those New Jersey warehouse, is to have the death of the author buy off his family. And then when he's dead, push through the courts of your venue that you own the material, no contest. You now own the rights to the immortals. These people have no creativity, do they? None, zero. It shows in their, in their art of war too. They're like, they're literal vultures for brilliant minds. With a need to feel clever, with a need to feel clever. They think wow. clever gets them women to bed and boys to bed, so they have to be clever. If they're embarrassed, or mocked, they can't handle it. They cannot handle it, they collapse. If a beautiful woman tells them they're nothing publicly, they can't handle it, they'll collapse. Did you see how uh, Andy responded to Trump's wife online? I don't recall. Well, he I have the uh, clip, but um, he's told uh, her to F off. They can't handle beautiful women affecting their image. Pat Robertson can't either. Pat Robertson can't stand it. That's why any beautiful woman that comes my way is approached immediately and told, don't worry, Tommy's evil, but keep it anonymous, don't tell him. They can't handle it. I've always been with amazing women, beautiful women, and it's like, apart from the honeypot wives, there's two. Now they have the audacity to bring why, uh, women my way, and uh, they actually bring them my way, contact me, and they'll actually say, I wasn't supposed to contact you yet, but... Um, you can be with us. I'll be really gentle. You'll be with me. And then you find out that their brother-in-law is the head of Warner Brothers Legal named Patrick from Columbia University, who was responsible for the ripoff of your work and also the Superman family, as they spell all this out. But she's got a red pendant, a glass red pendant, the red pill for you as a gift as you move in with her and sleep with her. No, I won't. I'll pass. I don't think I'll move in. I don't think I'll sleep with you. No, thanks. They keep it's, using women. It's amazing. It. Yeah, I was about to bring that up. Yeah, yeah. how they, they keep they think that's the way into uh, your mind or ha hacking hacking something with uh, I I don't know a way to get your your emotional investment into something. Yep, Robertson did it. Disney does it. Um, Warner Bros. does it. Um, it's like they all do. FBI does it. It's like they they offer beautiful women as if they're cattle. And they, they will, that's supposed to entice you. The Wachowskis, what were they promised at Dean Laurentiis dinner? Why was Dean Laurentiis dining them? Why and dining them? Promising them beautiful starlets. Success, money, fame. For what? They still haven't made Plastic Man and Carnivore. They haven't made anything that hasn't been stolen. And the reason they do it is because they can take failed writers, which will be loyal, in-house, so they can claim the work in-house. That's why. It's very simple. Their minds are not that bright. In fact, they're boring to me. Very boring. They don't have the layers of interest for me. That's why it's been so hard to do this too, not just because of the horrible losses that they threw at us and took from us, but because they're just not interesting people. And I hope women would see that eventually down the line, that these guys that are being enticed are trying to entice women yawn in their face. They're not interesting people. They're slobs. Yeah. Without a creative bone in their body. I still, the District 9 writer, director, I can't believe it. He actually said, you know, writing is like pulling teeth for him. 
<laughs> and then the, the people universe. were praising the story and the writing for that one too. Yeah. So Christopher, like- <laughs> Nolan, yeah, Christopher Nolan saying that he, you know, his professors told him in films or writing school that he'd never make it. Yeah. And he's, he tags his name onto all of his projects as well. I wonder how much of that's actually written by him at this Christopher point. Nolan is a thief. Is a thief. Bonafide. He just Boy, does he take it. He does it badly. He ruined that scene. He ruined the scene with a little girl. But he had to do it. Had to do it. Got to get credit. And when I talk about library memories in Interstellar, he puts a library. Oh, my God. He puts a library up. When you're talking behind the books of a library, Christopher Nolan, stop writing. Stop producing. You're horrible at it. Your professors were right. You suck. Yeah. and it, I mean, even going to his last film, uh, Tenet, where it's supposed to be like playing backwards and forwards at the same time. Like th- it didn't hold my attention like his previous <laughs> projects did. I was really lost because I, it was more of a concept film than um, telling a story. The reason is because they're trying to, Steve, they're trying to do layers. I talk about layered thinking and everything in the process I created. The yeah. work I understand is from layered thinking. And so now they're trying to do things that are like layered thinking. They don't understand layered thinking. They don't get it. It's a shallow one-line brain thing that they have trying to do layers. It's not going to work. It's going to be garbage. It'll never connect. You have to have the layered thinking to connect. I really like the layered storytelling when, like, the subplots also flow together with the main story. That's right. And it makes those um, those films really enjoyable to rewatch. Which I think that that's the point of of making a good script and um art in general with film that's right is that you're you're creating an experience that people can enjoy multiple times if they'd like to go back and and experience it again you can put the layers into the scene themselves the layers into scenes themselves they become mini films in themselves yeah they're water and interest by themselves that's something i intended too like the train station scene the train station scene has liquid mirrors they strip that out because they think it's a clever concept out of another clever concept. It has a little girl there too being pushed forward by their family. The liquid mirrors are there. If you take the pill, you can pass through the liquid mirrors. But they strip it out. They lift the images out. Here's an indication, an example, exactly how they do it. They lift it out and have Neil just putting his hand through while messing up the red pill, blue pill concept too, ruining the story of the little girl. It's infuriating that they picked the worst clowns in the world that failed at everything they ever did, their mom even said, to take the work, Steve. It is infuriating. Infuriating. And then take my son's lives in the process. And then to brag about it. Through people like Sophia Stewart that couldn't write anything in her life. And if you hear her talk, Sophia Stewart talk, do you think this person is sophisticated that can ever say anything without cursing or without sounding like, like she just walked off the street? Oh my god yeah I'm sorry i'm sorry they got a cast of clowns and they're all like you said all about importance and that's why they cast them that way because they're sucking it up they want the glamour they want the importance i've got a picture of sophia stewart was sent to me of her holding a fake academy award as if it's real dressed up in glitter lady give it up if you're a lady give it up But that's what, it's just been so frustrating. The whole transgender thing, again, it's another mockery by Warner Brothers out of the script. In the script, you actually have um, uh, females that no longer have genitalia, basically, because they had to remove it because of the agents uh, stirring up trouble to simulate the architect's mind. So uh, Andy and Larry really don't uh, dress up like that when they're in private then? Not in their home. No, Andy won't. And he won't. And he didn't want to do that. In fact, Andy was asking in an interview, are you happy now? He must be happy now. He said, not really. He didn't want to be a woman. He's just slapping a wig on in a black dress. Like I said, he looks like that. There's a James Bond clip where um, James Bond in the beginning opening sequence of the one series, uh, you know, Fleming series, where he is taking on this widow and she has a firebrand and they're beating each other up in the fireplace area of this rich place. And it's actually a man dressed as the widow. And he looks like this ugly man dressed as a widow. That looks like Andy to me, totally. There's no makeup. There's no redoing anything. It's just a black plain thing thrown on with a wig slapped on. He doesn't want to be. He's sending a message. I don't want to be a woman, but I'm forced to do it. That's the message. If he really cared about it and loved it, like Larry's eating up the attention, he would have done the clown thing too. He would have put the makeup on. He would have gone all out with the earrings and everything like that. So yeah, yeah, I know that. 
Because if you're really into it, the women would advise you on it and help you with it. How do I know that? Because in Cabaret, when I played the lead, which the attorneys for Warner Brothers tried to show pictures of me doing Cabaret, the MC in Cabaret, a great role, MC in Cabaret. Love that role. Great role. Real challenge as a performer. But they have pictures of me dressed up in drag saying, look, this is, look, he's dressed up in drag. He's, he's just like that. He's just up. That's the role. That's what it says in the script to do. Do I do that at home? No. Do I do that out there in public? No. Like you said, not at home. But the women were advising how to make it look good, how to do it. You know, you, the guy who's actually going to do that is going to do it right. If I'm going to do that role, I'm not going to walk out there with a, a wig slapped on and just a black plain dress. Yeah, like a dollar store wig and something yeah. that you pick yeah. up from Kohl's or something. <laughs> yeah. Little Andy's brain is trying to make to the public is, I don't really want to do this. Take a look. I don't really want to do this. Yeah. And then he's even asked, are you happy? You must be happy. No, I'm not really. Poor Andy. He did it with Aunt, he did it with Larry and stole his work. Couldn't resist. Jerk. And now Larry goes on Matrix 4. Andy doesn't. Andy's afraid. And he's afraid of being caught. Why would Andy not show up on it? Why wouldn't he take credit with it too? Doesn't want to get caught. Larry's the, he's the whore for going for it all the way. In fact, he said he needed a ladder. Otherwise, he'd kill himself. He didn't have a ladder. My work became his ladder. And my boys lost their lives for this ma this ladder for this failed writer. Failed writer, his own words, failed. In now, like, why do you think Andy took so long to follow suit with this whole thing? I mean, because it was, uh, with the dressing up as a woman? Yeah, yeah, because it, it was quite a long time before uh, he actually started doing that as well. I think they settled that Larry would do it and not Andy. Andy didn't want to do it. He absolutely didn't want to do it. And then after this happened, he doesn't want to show up and make us four and they forced him to do it. He said, look, you've got to do it now because I'm a threat. I'm a real threat right now, a real threat. That's why the 302s through Fitzpatrick and the FBI and all this other stuff connects to Hollywood. The reason they're doing all this is they want me shut away. And the deal there too was that if I was shut away on a 302, which they almost pulled off, Claim having my sister who's bought claiming with a family she's bought too claiming he oh, he said he's going to kill somebody he said he's going to kill his son he said he's going to he said he's suicidal no I didn't I never did never would but all I do is say it and the FBI uses that and the other chief of police enact it and they put people in place to say you did it so now that I'm a threat and didn't get put away just like when Joel Silver ran as soon as the car missed me now they got to do something with Andy to keep him under control they got to keep Andy under control. They got to batten down the fort because they, they can't have any leaks. So Andy needs to be under their control. Andy would feel like a fool coming forward and saying they made me do this. I think he would feel foolish. I think he'd feel foolish because he wants to feel like, no, he's like the bar guy. You know, he gets in a brawl in a bar. That's how he likes to present himself. Like, yeah, I'm real tough. You know, that's how he always presents himself. A bar guy that likes to fight in bars, likes to be tough, doesn't want to admit that they were made to put a dress on against their will. You know, no, that shows weakness. And you're not going to have it. Yeah, and it seems like it's a humiliation ritual in a way, it, too. Um, it means the rest of his life he's known as a weakling in his mind. When he wants to be the toughest guy in the block. Wow. They know how to play the egos. They know how to play. They think they know how. With people with compassion and actually love their kids and things like this and actually do the work, they don't understand. I can tell you, Steve, writing The Immortals, writing the project that became The Matrix and Elysium and Interstellar and all this, writing the work itself was a journey and an experience that was unreal. I was crying, laughing at the same time. It flowed. I could see it. It was like Mozart seeing, hearing the music at once, seeing it all playing out. I'm writing as fast as I can. It flowed. It worked. I knew, like you said, there was layers in it where this subplot might mean somebody to, some, somebody, somebody to someone where it might not to others, but it will draw them in. But the main thing would mean something to everybody. People could fill in their stories and lives into the piece to make it their own, their own story. And everybody could have their take on it, which would encourage creativity across the world as everybody would be allowed to take their take on it. The Wachowski's take was the worst I could ever imagine. The world was robbed of this experience and ability to do. Yeah, and, I'm, and I'm sorry that it happened. I mean, there's nothing I couldn't do about it except this which is bringing you on here to talk about it that's huge that's huge i'm not supposed to be heard i am not supposed to be heard sophia stewart says I'm supposed to be a footnote only now she says i'm the evil one really they actually constructed a thing a whole prophecy thing it's created now which says i'm the evil uh the son of light the evil one the one that was coming they have done this 
And that was done in this African-American community thing where they created this thing for Sophia Stewart, where it's prophecies about her being the light to come and the, um, that I'm the evil one. I'm sorry, but you just wrote your prophecy just now. That doesn't sound much like prophecy. That sounds like you just created something very convenient to make yourself even more. Her, her whole thing, Sophia Stewart's company, is um, called All Eyes on Me. It's like, yeah, I mean, come on now. Total okay. ego trip. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me show that one more time. I know we're probably going way over time on you here, but let me just show you um, that, that shot right there where she actually contacts me saying she wants to be um, friends with me. And it's just, it's really a trip. I'm just gonna move this over here until I find it. Where is it, where is it, where is it? Okay, hold on a sec, one second. Uh, here it is. Okay, her company name, that's my mom, by the way, the real mother of the Matrix. I give her her credit there in this excerpt. Okay, here's Sophia Stewart asking a friend request to me for to confirm, after she's trashing me, like in this very thing right next to it. Um, speaking to her friend that sent it to me. Thomas is not seeking justice, just pure ego and publicity. No, thanks. You and Thomas will never accomplish anything. He's just a footnote, nothing else. You teamed up with a loser from a cult. She calls all the times and says that my kids were killed because of me and a cult. Look over here then. Her company, owner, writer, producer, all eyes on me incorporated. <laughs> uh, who has the ego? Who's got the ego? And University of Southern California, where she came from, where she failed, and they brought her out to recruit her. There she is asking for a friend request. Crazy. A lot of them coming out from University of Southern California. That's right. That's a go-to place. They have alumni, so they can have alumni loyalty in order to do crime. Didn't Spielberg yeah. uh, fail out of that, too? I and, then so. he, and then yeah. he came back, and he, uh, I think he uh, bought part of the school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they got him that way. And then University of Berkeley, like I said, their law school is completely the one that fuels all these corrupt attorneys. So they're alumni that do it, judges, everything else. La Loya, La Loya, L-O-Y-O-L-A, California, is the one that uh, puts out the corrupt judges too, that the alumni to do them, use them. So University of Berkeley, La Loya College, whatever, in California, and uh, University of Southern California. Wow. We go to grounds. Well, that's all a lot to digest. It um, is. I know it is. I know it is. And there's a lot, so lots, lots more. So, yeah. Um, I really, I, I'd like to continue this conversation at another time. Um, it'd be great to talk to you again. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's been, I think, almost two and a half hours, almost three hours. <laughs> like, like your piece, like your piece. That's great. Yeah. That, that's when good work is done often. It's like long ones are actually because there's so much to it. They're saying there's nothing to it. I'd say we kind of beat that. And the idea too is that, you know, what we've done here um, we're showing the evidence and they, if, if a person writes a piece like we do, like the work we've written or done, documentary you did, if we see it through, that shows a real writer and a real producer and director. We saw it through. A lot of people say they have ideas and they don't go any farther than that. They claim to be a writer. But if we're able to do this work and see it through, I have put that much attention and time into revealing the trail and finding the trail because that's what lost my son's lives. Can I share a quick story with you? Sure. So um, at Columbia College Chicago for my directing three project, uh, The Man, it was a short film. Um, I was given a lot of pushback for the content. I was writing the scenes I was creating, uh, the, the characters. I was, I was being recommended by the teacher to uh, make, like change sexuality of, of some of the characters. Yeah, a lot of pressure. Yeah, with, with no explanation behind it, they just, thought it would be like a good spice to throw into the pot to make it uh, whatever, I guess, more appealing to whoever they thought were going to be watching it. But um, I stuck through with my vision, my idea. Um, I never changed the title. Good. I, I really uh, got a lot of pressure to change it and call it something else, but um, I wouldn't do it. There were other people in my class who did something with uh, so something sexual with um, wearing a like a, a costume, like those furry things or whatever. Right. So there was there was some really raunchy stuff that was coming out of that class, and um, I was really looking for a more traditional uh, type of narrative, and I was pulling influence from film noir, and I didn't want to go to 
uh, too rated R. I wanted it so that more people, it, it would be more appropriate for younger viewing audiences too. Sure. Sure. And um, yeah, I ended up, uh, I guess, around like a PG-13 type of, so it was like a middle ground for where I was with that. But I had all these things happen on, on the set. I had a location I had to change. I had to go use a backup location because uh, the person that was working the location didn't want to work with me. Um, I asked them to like turn down some some music. They turned it up. Oh. Uh, yeah, so that type of stuff. And um, I had <laughs> I had a line producer that never showed up and uh, gave me all of these emails while the while we were on set like oh this happened to me this happened to me but um i mean i powered through it and uh i ended up getting a good passing grade for the class i think i got an a on the class on the yeah. just yeah. my overall uh way that i treated the cast and crew and uh how the final product looked from the final draft that i went in before I, uh we started production and shooting mm -hmm. But uh, I, n I never had an intention. I still don't have an intention to go out to Hollywood or Los Angeles. And um, I I would like to get out of Illinois. But uh, <laughs> it might be a little while before that happens. Well, I sure appreciate your presence and um, your demeanor. And I can, I'm really on the lookout for people that are actually genuine and uh, articulate and uh, have a heart. And that's what's going to happen. You're going to see more and more people. Um, coming together like that, looking for that, purposely looking for that, and you'll see a different Hollywood. You'll, you're actually talking about new Hollywood. There are times. Yeah, I, I'm. I say that uh, there's the Hollywood era, mm -hmm. and we are in the post Hollywood era now. Oh, absolutely! Because Joel Silver's one run twice for me. When it first went forward, remember they they brought the attorney in to um, miss the deadline for serving them. And then he's running because it was going to change where I was going to talk to the judge. He runs when I'm going to talk to the judge. That's when he runs. And then they throw it and he comes back. 25 years severed. And then Oliver Carbon runs. So Joel Silver's going to run again. And when these guys start running again, Lucas and all them, I, in fact, MGM Studios and Fox and all these guys sold right back out to Disney, those, those companies, right out to Disney when we came forward and get, getting traction. They sold out to the mothership that started all this ripoff idea that spread it through the studios. And so they all sold out back to the Disney who instigated it all. So you're going to see the, the dirt's going to run. It's going to run for the vacuum cleaner. As soon as we show up, they're going to run again and good people will take the place. And that's what even Pop Rossi has been talking about. So then we shall see a golden age in Hollywood when these clowns like Lucas and all these other guys, Spielberg especially, uh, Joel Silver, you know, the Wachowskis even, you know, are gone. And then keep in mind, they have their inner squabbles. They each have their inner squabbles. They don't like each other. They're doing special things for their media they own to make it look like they're good people, to protect their legacies now. Spielberg's are doing a whole thing on Spielberg now as if he was this poor kid that had these challenges mentally. And, you know, he still came through. No, he just lifted work. Same with Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. So it's like, it's going to come forward now. As they each covered each other, that's going to unravel. Fight Club will be talking because it's all of a sudden they're going to be talking. They're going to say, okay, well, I covered for him and I did this and I covered that. Michael Eisner's already started to do that by revealing his big payoff. He did. That's a good him. analogy for what's going on. It is. Fight and Club. that's why, you know, the credit goes to Mike Lang for being dumb to reveal the trail to Disney. I say to Mike Lang, thank you for taking the wife to bed. Thank you for the emails showing that, even though you struck them for devices, we had an external uh, storage, you idiot. And then revealing Michael Eisner tied to Pat Robertson, we would never have known it wasn't for you, Mike Lang, who never is mentioned in the media. Let's mention him. Yeah. Toast up. Sounds good. There, I'll, I'll make a toast to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> to Mike Lang. To the Mike Lang. Revealed it all because of his ego. There you go. <laughs> That's poetic that they fall because of their ego. I love it. He wanted to up the author. He wanted to be better than the author. So he thinks that taking the author's wife to bed would be the major man blow ever to the author. That was a planted wife, a honeypot wife. Take her. That just means the job's done. My son can actually have a good person later. And there are women stepping forward that aren't yet. Yeah, they're approached, but they're still hanging in there and they're good people. Yeah. I'll end up with somebody who's like, you know, smart, intelligent, beautiful person. I like that. And I'll stop ending up with honeypots. And it's going to be a great, great life. 
I want to live a life where we celebrate and friends like you, you know, people, um, I would say, I'll consider you a friend. You did the work. You did this. I would offer that to you, you know, celebrate Thank together. You. Let's celebrate together. Let's get great work done. So yeah, I think we have a lot to look forward to. I think so. Um, there's just, uh, there, I, I'm at a loss for words, but what will be revealed will yeah. be so groundbreaking. And, uh, like you said, like a, like a flip of a switch yep. and hopefully it'll, um, be a really, uh, peaceful mo like right. time, yeah. not just moment, but time and afterwards. Not to be gruesome, but they're going to have to pick a couple bodies off the sidewalk from high rises, but it'll be these guys that were the players in this and they, they crafted their own nooses. So it's just a little work for the janitors. And I won't miss them. I won't miss them. These people that do evil, they like to think, including what my sister are being bought now. It's all about power. Part of that process is they want to believe that people are just going to think of them, that that's all ever people ever think about is them and how amazing they are and their image. And people don't. That is a delusional thought process. We don't. We don't think of you. You're not that important. One of the things my sister said to me, too, when she was trying to get me to say these terrible things on the tape, I said, um, she said, if you don't say these things, then you don't, you're saying I don't matter. That was her main concern. My son just died and you're calling me to tell me that. So anyway, it's going to be, it's going to be a great world. It's going to be a beautiful world. It could happen overnight instantly. Um, and it can, every, people, right people in place. And we've been conditioned, those of us like yourself, we have gone through the gauntlet. We've gone through the fire. We're ready. Nothing sways us. We've got the compassion. We haven't lost our character. We've got our smarts. We understand how it works. We saw the broken system. We know how to run a good system. We can take over at the helm right now and drive very smoothly this Porsche of a world. I agree. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful world. So yeah, it's going to happen. One interesting thing too is that I just want to throw this in that they say if they if a person that rips off material intellectual property keeps mistakes in it, that it's really tell, tell, telling, right? Besides the birthday being corrected, there's many more. But here's one of my favorites: the key in the tunnel. There's a key device that you turn the key and it blows the tunnel in the Matrix, and it's one shot deal. You blew the tunnel. That's all we get. Yeah, the, the EMP. Yeah. Yeah, and that's right in here. I was embarrassed about it because I did put it in here and the Wachowskis used it anyway because they thought anything they'd take could be clever and it'd work in their favor. But they yeah, the one turn key is in here. It's a one shot deal. And uh, what's interesting is when they do it, the main character is in the fake Oval Office in the underground city. So they actually put the fake Oval Office in real life. It is real life imitating art. Wow. Mm -hmm. They're so drunk on this material, as Bonaventura said, it's revolutionary. We're making this. That immortal screenplay, they thought everything had been done under the sun. Quote, everything's been done under the sun. There's so much tech in there, so much stuff in there. And it drives the story, Steve. It Surrey, Surrey in there drives the story. There's a reason for Surrey's creation on our phones. The reason we have this, I won't turn on right now. The reason it's on here is because our character in the immortals misses his wife so much. They took it out, that relationship. And keep in mind that in um, uh, Assassins, or whatever, Assassins, they took, uh, they, were, they brought another writer in because they took the central sympathetic character out. They took their love relationships out. That's what they did in The Immortals. That's exactly what they did when they had free reign, when Joel Silver appeased them in 95. So what you have is you've got um, Suri being used in ours, where our main character loses his loved one. And so he programs his house, everything, all his devices to her voice speaking as if she'd speak to him in a conversational way. And Spielberg ate it up, everybody ate it up. And then the devices came out after that. But it drives the story. It drives the story. Not in Spielberg's work, but in ours it does. Yeah. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, I don't know that you've, I, I guess not necessarily inspired these other filmmakers but you've influenced what's been brought to the public that everybody understands as their work which is actually yours that's right but just like the mass um exposure that your work's gotten under false pretenses is just astounding because that's it's a, i mean i'm not sure i i'd rather say it's because of the quality of what you've written it 
like that's that's the reason why it's gotten out the way it has but it's also them pushing it to try to get their names out there and take credit for what you've done that's right well think of it this way too you just raised a good issue and point think of it that okay the media newsweek covers um all this stuff is on me think of it this particular example would people know who i am would they accept that it's true if i had the grooming that Keanu Reeves had and all that stuff. And what's interesting is when this first story first broke, it was ABC News, it was New York Times, their chief, bureau chief is on the phone saying, don't go anywhere, I'm putting two writers on this, don't go anywhere, this is huge. I could call their um, uh, sales department and get connected to the bureau chief. And it's like in LA Times, same thing, don't go anywhere, put two writers on this. It's like, that's the only separation. You have me on here, I'm on other interviews and people see it. But think of it if it had all the glitz and glamour of their PR machine, then people wouldn't across the world wouldn't bat an eye. They'd say, yeah, Tom is basically Elon Musk. They wouldn't bat an eye. It's just that stripped away. I want audiences to realize that's what they've done. They've taken nobodies and given them all this glitz and media coverage that they own in order to say, this is who you're supposed to worship. This is who you're to lift up. You know, well, we that don't want that attention or worship just want the truth out that we can have our families intact and lift others. So a better world is definitely coming. And part of the control of the media system with the six families basically owning it all, uh, when that breaks down, including Robertson owning media, it's going to be a different world. Wow, we'll finally get to hear a different world, see a different world, and see all kinds of people we would never have known were there. And I look forward to other people having their stories brought forward, heroes that have never been sung. And I think the Lord is protecting you and has your back because after everything you've told us today, like it's amazing that you're still here oh, and, yeah. and I'm, I'm thankful that you are. It's just, it blows my mind knowing that all of this has happened to you and that only now that you're able to come forward with all of this publicly and uh, share your story. And you know what, Steve? Thank you for that very much, first of all. And really, it's because of their greed. Besides protection from the higher power, their greed, their greed, which I think that was put in place for a reason. So I'm alive. My son's alive, my last son, because they think that they control what they, they think they can control their asset. They still think they can cash in on it. They never think of compassion. They it's really think. sad that they think of it as and they think of you as an asset That's what I'm instead talking. of a human being. Yeah, they said star player on the bench, asset, golden goose, you name it. That's what they think. So because of my creativity, now think of this. This is chilling because I'm alive because of my abilities. What about those that don't have so many abilities? They're not needed in their world. In their world, they're just cut away when the time's right for them, when the one world society is set in place. That's not fair to those people. They have dreams, feelings, families, caring, art. They should not judge a utilitarian Charles Dickens way, hard times. No, you don't get to judge who matters, especially when those making the judgment are the least that matter. I agree. We'll show them who matters. And that's a lot of people out there that have never had their story told. Yeah. Better world's coming. Better world. I think well, it's so that they're agreed that has allowed us to be alive it's, and, and the higher power. There's been a lot of people, they all are silent. They know what's going on. They said, if we got 20% of the population in the world, that this would just snowball back on the other side, it'd be over. I'm told now 20% of the people do know, but everybody's basically remaining silent, waiting for the success. That 20% know about what's really going on? His story. Yeah, because of all that was done by the other side. Those were worldwide publications they own putting it out there, mocking me with Wachowski's face and saying, no, nothing hack and everything else. And people kept saying, I know there's more to this. I know there's more. That's why they have this thing flooding those airwaves saying, you know, he lost his case. That's supposed to make everybody just turn away and go, no story here. And that's the other phrase he used, no story here. Then they say this other talking point, no one's going to care. No one cares. No one's going to look. They believe that. We're going to show them there's a more a better world, a smarter world out there that the audiences aren't as dumb as Spielberg and Lucas paint them. 
that we actually are smart people out here and we should be driving the car. Not the yeah, spoiled definitely kids. not them. Not the spoiled kids. Yeah. Time for the daddies to come home. Put the house in order. That's for damn sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for sharing all this with me. Pleasure and honor. It's um, it's it's a it's a lot to take in. I know I'm going to be rewatching this too <laughs> after I put it up, but uh, it's just uh, yeah, connecting all of the people involved and uh, just knowing what they've done and what's been presented as their own work. And it's actually yours. Like it, they I know how it's frustrating. I know how frustrating it, but it is. And um, yeah, but you handle it really well. And I know, I know you, you probably had a few times where didn't feel as strong as you are now, but um, I think, I, you definitely know there's light at the end of the tunnel and we're close to the to exiting the tunnel. And um, and it's worth it. If I help other people, it's worth it. Compassion is the ruler of the day. That's where we're going to have a better world. If we embody compassion, we cannot be defeated. We'll never stop. No matter how hard it gets, how many loved ones turned, bought, murdered, we don't stop because it will always matter us continuing so yeah absolutely yeah so it's 5 15 we've, right. we've gone three hours <laughs> marathon man you're the marathon so yeah if you ever want to go again with a part two i'm totally in but i appreciate what you've done steve and thank you you've got a great presence you're a great listener and you're smart and articulate. And um, boy, I, it, I, the more I do these things, I see it's going to be a better world. The wrong people are calling the shots right now. When the right people are calling the shots, and like yourself, you've got these gifts and you've got these stories, and you've got these abilities and these projects. It's like, wow, this world is not going to be boring. It's not going to be boring once the right people are in position and the losers stop trying to shut us down. When they, then our hands are taken away out of the cookie jar, it's going to be a great world. It's going to be a great world. And we're going to look at what they created. And it's going to just be a mess, a mess. And we'll tidy it up and have a great, great way of life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And in the meantime, we'll just keep fighting, right? All right. Take care. All right. Have a good one, Tom. You too. It's nice talking to you. You too.